and turn it over to Lisa Minton from CODES. We are convened electronically pursuant to Governor Lee's Executive Order 71 in order to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak and still conduct essential business of the Metropolitan Government. Before we move on with the meeting, the Governor's Executive Order requires a motion to proceed electronically. Okay, uh, there's a motion to proceed electronically. Is there a second? There's a second. And is that Ms. I'm Mr. sorry, Pat it's Tom Lawless. Mr. Lawless, okay, uh, seconded by Mr. Lawless. Uh, as I call the roll uh, to meet electronically, that will also establish our attendance and uh, our quorum, if that's acceptable to our legal counsel. And so we have a motion, we have a second to meet electronically. Uh, Ms. Davis. In favor. Ms. Karpinick. In favor. Mr. Newton. Favor. Mr. Pepper. In favor. Mr. Lawless. In favor. I'll vote in favor also. So that establishes our ability to meet electronically and the fact that we have a quorum and all members uh, at this point are present. In order to convene this meeting pursuant to that executive order, the board members are participating remotely and we encourage members of the public to submit comments in support or opposition to the board electronically at bza at nashville.gov. We extended the deadline to submit comments and any comments received by 12 o'clock noon yesterday, Wednesday, March 3rd, were provided to the board for consideration prior to the hearing. Additionally, members of the public can call 629-255-1903 to provide comments in support or opposition to any case called on today's docket. We ask that you wait until the case is introduced prior to placing your call. Good afternoon, the Metropolitan Board of Zoning Appeals is now in session for the regularly scheduled meeting of March 4th, 2021. My name is Lisa Minna and I will be presenting the cases to the board for the review in today's public hearing. We are convened electronically. For these hearings, the board reviews the correspondence submitted in support of and opposition to these cases. The board also reviews correspondence and, recommend and recommendations from other government agencies in preparation for their hearing. In today's hearing, staff will will present the site plans, maps, photographs, and other documents that comprise the case record. At the conclusion of the staff presentation, the appellant will present his or her case to the board. After the appellant's presentation, we will allow anyone wishing to speak in support of or opposition to the case to, to call into the meeting. During the electronic proceedings, the appellant has five minutes for their presentation. Anyone calling in to provide public input will be given two minutes to speak. The appellant will then have any time remaining from their initial five minutes, as well as an additional five minutes for rebuttal for a total of 10 minutes. At the conclusion of each hearing, the board will deliberate and then vote on that case. The board is vested by the power to act on these cases under the provisions of the Metro Zoning Code, section 174180. And all section numbers that we refer to come from the Metro Zoning Code, which applies to the entire jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Government. The zoning code was adopted by the Metro Council and became effective on January 1st, 1998. I will introduce the entire zoning code and make it part of today's record. The Metro code requires a record of these proceedings. Because BZA meetings are recorded for Metro Nashville Network, it is imperative that anyone addressing the board, all, all speakers should identify themselves by name and address and then make their desired presentation. The Metro Code requires four members of our six member board to establish quorum. The code also requires at least four affirmative votes to grant an appeal. In the event that five or more members are present, but the appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within 30 days of the public hearing shall be deemed denied by operation of law. Pursuant to board rules, an aggrieved party may appeal board decisions to chancery or circuit court within 60 days of the entry of the BZA order. Additionally, as per the BZA rules, an aggrieved party may file a motion for rehearing by the BZA within 60 days of the original hearing date. After that time elapses, the board's decision becomes final and no further, further action can be taken. If your appeal is granted, you're required to obtain the permit for which you applied. A permit must be obtained within two years for the board approval to remain valid. 
It should also be noted that if, if false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board approval could be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing before the BZA. Mr. Chairman, I submit that all cases have been filed in proper order. All appellants have been notified by certified mail and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled. Great, thank you. We do have some preliminary announcements concerning deferrals. Case 2021-020 at 36 Green Street has been deferred to the March 18th meeting to provide more time for the appellant to communicate with the council member. Case 2021-021 has been deferred to the March 18th meeting to provide more time for the appellant to request input from neighbors at the council member's request. And case 2021-035 at 922 Mara Road has been deferred by the, the uh, appellant. Okay. Okay, the BJA utilizes a consent agenda for its meetings. One board member reviews the record for each case prior to the hearing and identifies those cases which meet the criteria for the required action by the appellant. If the reviewing board member determines that testimony in the case would not alter the material facts in any substantial way, the case is recommended to the board for approval. Well, the following items are proposed for the consent agenda on today's docket. If anyone opposes any one of these cases, they can call in at 629-255-1903 at this time and state their opposition for the board's consideration. Case 2021-036 located at 2306 Lloyd Avenue and also case 2021-037 at 2308 Lloyd Avenue. Our adjacent properties requesting a variance from the street setback requirements in the R10 zoning district for proposed two residential unit development on each lot. Case 2021-038 located at 2000 Church Street, requesting a variance from the building facade and entrance requirements within the MUIA and the UZO district. The appellant is constructing a new medical office building. Case 2021-041, located at 16 Claiborne Street and requesting a variance from the side street setback and the garage orientation requirements in an R6 zoning district for proposed development of two single family residences. The final case on consent is case 2021-044, located at 383 Berrywood Drive, requesting a variance from the the side setback requirements within an RS5 district. They're proposing to construct a two-story addition to the rear of the existing single family residence. Okay, I think we uh, need to wait a minute or two for anybody that wants to call in and voice objection uh, to those items being on the consent agenda. And also we'll note that case 041 is on the consent agenda and it is uh, basically just reinstating a request that was approved by this board in 2018. Um, our, our approvals last for two years, as has been stated uh, prior to the meeting and or at the beginning of the meeting and uh, this approval expired before they were able to get their building permit. So then that case is just uh, a continuation of, of what this board has approved before. And ask Ms. Shepard if anybody's called in. We have not had any callers. All right, seeing uh, no opposition uh, called in, uh, there's a motion for the consent agenda. Is there a second? There's a second, Tom Lawless. Seconded by Mr. Lawless. Um, any discussion on the consent agenda? Uh, seeing none, uh, then we will call the question and vote. Start with Mr. Lawless. In favor. Ms. Davis? In favor. Ms. Karpinek? In favor. Mr. Newton? Favor. Mr. Pepper? In favor. I vote in favor also. That motion uh, passes. Mr. Chairman, okay. there is a previously heard case requiring board action for case 2021-018 located at 1024 Wade Avenue. Right, and this this case is one that the board, uh, if if we don't vote today, then it, it will uh, 
it will uh, be disapproved for the lack of, of getting um, four votes. And the vote uh, was to approve the variance, but it failed four to one. So it had four votes against the variance, but there was never the formal vote. Uh, I think when it happened, we all assumed that it just failed and it, uh, and we voted no, but we actually didn't. We voted against a yes. And so for it to be official, we actually have to uh, to vote one way or the other. So I don't know if, if the board members remember the case. If folks are not comfortable voting for it, then we can just uh, not vote at all and just let it uh, fail um, by you know having its time expire. Uh, otherwise, if you do feel comfortable, then uh, we can take a motion and uh, see if anyone's mind has changed or at least go on record as having an official vote one way or the other and settle the case. Is is there anyone, I guess, it, it show your hand uh, if you uh, don't remember the case well enough to feel comfortable to vote? So I've got one. Is there anybody else that would feel uncomfortable voting on this? Does anybody object to just not voting? Are, are you going to ask if we're just changing our votes? That's well, no, that, no, but the, the issue was when, when I think it was all discussed and it was felt like that, you know, the board was feeling like they were going to vote against it. And, but the motion just happened to be, hey, we're, I'm going to move that we grant the variance. Well, that motion failed. And so because it it didn't um, it didn't receive a, 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 a follow-up vote, that's my fault, um, for actually voting to deny the variance, it's still on our docket. So... I would, I think it may be, unless there's objection to me, it, because after today, it, I think it, it, Lisa, is that correct? After today, it's, it's dead. Is it 30, it's 30 days? 30 day window, yes. Okay. Well, it, and since I, it, it sounds like folks are, are, or, or maybe a, a little confused and or not familiar enough with the case to vote. And so unless there's objection, I think we just leave it um, and, and let it uh, let it die on its own because the outcome would have been uh, the, the same um, as, as the vote that we actually took. It just is, is there objection to that? David, can I just ask, is there requesting party here by any chance i mean not that you want to open it up for yeah i don't i don't know that they are but like i said they they got four votes against the variance request so i don't know that they would have any expectation that this would have a chance to pass and we're not hearing it again it just uh when it's held up in votes it really is a chance for uh folks to go you know who weren't here to go back and hear the case and folks who had heard the case to either reconsider and had we taken a vote that day to make it official, it would have failed that day. Uh, so, Ms. Carpenter, did you have something? I don't know where this is going, but I was going to say I did watch the case and I looked at and I reviewed the materials. Um, I was the missing board member that day. Okay. David, so do I do I take it correctly that you're looking in essence for a motion to deny the request? Yes. Okay. I make a motion we deny the request. Is there a second? Second for Mr. Pepper. Uh, Mr. Pepper, there's a motion, there's a second. Any discussion? All right, then we'll vote. Uh, Mr. Lawless? In favor of the motion. Uh, Mr. Pepper? In favor. Uh, Mr. Newton? Against. Ms. Carpenter? Opposed. Ms. Davis? In favor of the motion. I'll vote in favor also. So that motion passes four to two. 
And the next item, uh, there's a case uh, number 43 on Murphy Road that uh, one of the parties has asked that we defer this case. And I know there are a lot of folks, um, I think, attending to speak on this case. And as a result of the request to deferral, I think it's important for us to address that issue and that issue only, not the case itself, um, since the case is at the end of the meeting. And um, again, unless there's objection from uh, the board, uh, I would like to raise the question of whether or not we hear this case today uh, or not um, with the motion to defer by one of the parties. Ms. Karpinek? I would agree that the case should be deferred. Um, I think the property owner should be given the proper amount of time to um, review the case against them. Well, and, and, and what I was asking for was not have us de debate that because I, I really want to hear from both parties. The appellant, uh, the appellant uh, would like to hear the case. The property owner, um, who is not the appellant, uh, would like to defer, but also is requesting a. I, I think we need to hear from both sides before we make that decision as a board. Um, very respectful of your your thoughts on it, but uh, I wanna, I'm sorry, I jumped the gun. <laughs> yeah, jumped the gun a little bit. So, sorry no, about I was, that. <laughs> objection to hearing whether or not we defer this early. I, Mr. Mr. Chairman, are how many people are here and want to speak on it? I haven't that not that I'm I haven't made a decision one way or the other because it hasn't you know you haven't set it up that way. I'm just trying to figure out if you know if there's one or two people if we just ask them to come back or not. I mean, it just well, no, it's not. Uh, it it's you know it it is it's the longest uh, in terms of. Uh, paper trail is the longest case we have. There's an awful lot of interest. Uh, and again, I can't see, I know there are 18 people that are uh, waiting in line to speak on in, in some regard, but I don't know who these people are and what case they're uh, wishing to, to speak on. And so uh, I know that at least one of the appellants is on uh, just seeing that by name, but, but again, the, the request is made, it's not unusual for us to hear um, deferral request of this nature up front, again, that it's not to hear the case, it is to say, um, frankly, in my mind, did each side have enough uh, time to prepare? Is there any uh, compelling information that could be gained or, you know, or learned between now and the end of the deferral period that would uh, substantively change the case? And frankly, if we were to vote on the case and it would, were to go one way or the other, does the losing side have a remedy if we were to hear it now and not defer it? And that, uh, to me, those are the questions if we want to address it, or we just, you know, say, you know, it's it's number 43, we'll hear the case and then decide if if there's a compelling reason to defer it at that point, we can do that. But the, re the request was made, I thought I'd raise it. And how, how long was the deferral requested for, David? They wanted a month, and I, I think that's uh, excessive. But again, I, I don't wanna get into a discussion with us on, to me it's, do we wanna allow them to, uh, to raise the issue of deferral now, or do we wanna just keep it in the, where it is in the docket and hear that when it comes up? and and. Hear, you know, hear the case and, and have that as part of the argument. And I'm fine with that too. So again, just, just wanting a quick discussion on opinions and then we can move forward with the docket. Mr. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I would point out that, that historically on this board, and, and there's a factual dispute here because the applicant, um, they're, they're, the applicant's position is that the owner did receive notice and ha has had enough time, and the owner's position is that they have not. And we usually have not tried to resolve those factual disputes. We have just uh, given the party who uh, uh, states that they have not had enough notice, we've given them the benefit of the doubt. I do think m a month sounds like uh, probably too much for me, but for what it's worth, that's 
I'll throw that out there, and I'm willing to make a motion that we move it to the top just to vote on whether there should be a deferral or not. So if there are a lot of people hanging out by their telephones waiting to call in, they're not doing that for a long period of time. Right. Well, we wouldn't we wouldn't hear from any of the public in, in the deferral motion. It's just both sides. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to second his motion so that we could have at least whatever. We All right. So we will hear. Uh, well, and 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 I don't know that a motion's necessary because I I can, you know, as chairman I can bring something up. But I I did um, I mean I can move the docket, and so I will move this case. Uh, you know, move the discussion of the deferral um, to the head of the docket, um, and ask. I think the order. What we'll do is we will hear from the. Um, the property owner who is asking for the deferral, and then we'll hear from the appellant, uh, who is, uh, again, it's an item A case, so the appellant and the uh, uh, opponent is are, are, are kind of flip-flop. So uh, we will hear from first the well, folks asking for the deferral, and then we will hear from the uh, folks who actually filed the appeal. Uh, each side will be given five minutes, and then the board will uh, discuss and decide if we want to hear the case today or allow uh, aside more time. So is the, I believe it was that the uh, property owner is represented by an attorney. Sean Henry, I believe. Mr. Henry. Is Mr. Henry with us? Ms. Shepard, has anybody heard from Mr. Henry? Hold on just a second, please. Sean is not in the list of attendees right now. We do have a call in user, but we're not sure who that is. We have a representative of the Okay, we can we un is, is Mr. Henry on the call in? He is not. We're trying. He's not. Has not called into the phone line. We have two users listed as attendees and they just have a phone number listed, not by name. So we're trying to figure out if one of those people would be Sean. Sean, if you are on the, the line, can you speak up? Mr. Henry? Doesn't appear that he is in the meeting at this point. Okay, I, I'm getting a note that he, I think he's trying to get in, not, not from Mr. Henry, but from my administrative support folks at my codes are saying I think he's trying to get in, so. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. 
Uh, let me, while we're waiting for Mr. Henry, let me make sure I, what I stated for the record wasn't exactly correct. What the the applicant uh, position, the applicant's position is that the owners had plenty of time to get ready for this appeal, and Mr. Henry's letter says that. Um, the owner did learn about the application on January 26, but was did not retain uh, Mr. Henry until February 8th, and Mr. Henry has not had adequate time to do a factual investigation. So I stated it a little bit wrong, but I, I think, you know, this board has um, typically deferred um, when people have uh, obtained lawyers who have wanted more time. Right. I guess it, yeah, and we can we can discuss that, and I I I I agree with that. It's a little bit to me. It's a little different in a case that is where possibly a, a building is going up that is not, you know, a proper building, and so you know that you know the the month is you know it's already been three and a half weeks since. Um, the retention of the attorney and I, I and I appreciate wanting more time but I'm not sure and again it's a it's an eligibility for you know a duplex is it grandfathered or not and there's fairly compelling evidence in in the case file and so I, I think to me it's it's a question of to the attorney is what uh, what specific information um, would you need over the next, you know, again, they're asking for a, a month, which I think is excessive, but we're starting to talk about, I guess we're all, get, because we're waiting, getting in, into a little bit of the discussion, but um, Mr. Is, Chairman, you have Mr. Henry? We do have Mr. Henry on the line. All right, Mr. Henry, this is David Taylor. Uh, we're just, I'm not sure if you heard um, the discussion so far, but where we are is uh, only, only, um, hearing the request for a deferral and wanted to hear uh, you know your your thoughts on asking for a deferral and then we'll hear from the other side and then we'll have a board discussion mr henry are you there yes ma'am can you hear me yes sir yeah, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Oh, yes. right, hey, this is Sean Henry. Um, I was waiting for the number to be, you know, posted on, on the screen here. On um, the event, the number wasn't there, and I couldn't call in. I heard you all asking for me. I apologize for the miscue. Uh, but if you're ready for me to make my pitch, I'm, I'm ready to do so. Yes, sir. Just on the deferral piece, it's, uh, we're just we're just now deciding, uh, again, because we know we have a lot of interested parties on the line. Um, we're just deciding if we're going to hear the case uh, later in the pocket today. Yes, sir. Well, again, are, are we, is this on public hearing right now? I mean, are we, are we yes. locked down? Okay. Well, so I represent Mr. Brad Bars, who's the innocent purchaser here. Um, and, and of course, I filed a letter requesting some additional time. But the, the facts that are being asserted by the appellants involve predecessors to my client, people who owned the property before my client owned the property. And uh, I understand you have received an email from one of the prior owners, but, but the other owner, um, the husband, we have not, I have not had an opportunity to speak with that individual. My understanding is he lives in Georgia, uh, and there's other people who know the facts at hand, uh, frankly, better than, than the appellants, because one of the appellants did not live there uh, during that period of time uh, that it was used you know, as a duplex as well. So um, it, it's important, obviously, there's two sides to every story, and uh, there's two people that own this property for a period of about 15, 17 years or so. And, and one of them, one of the two, has alleged a fact that may or may not be true. And so this board is only appeals as the trier of fact needs to hear all of the facts. Right now, you've got some facts that may or may not be true. And we need the opportunity here. We need some additional time to be sure that you have all the facts, all the pertinent facts, relevant facts. And I know this board does a really good job of making sure that 
that evidence is presented so that you don't have a follow-up request for a rehearing, which is exactly what I'm going to do. If this matter is considered today, and if there's an action taken today uh, that's adverse to my client, I have no choice but to file uh, up to 60 days from now a request for a rehearing and submit evidence that I presently don't have and could not reasonably have had by the filing deadline for, for that evidence. As an example, one of the appellants here, Ms. Rance, submitted a letter Tuesday night. I appreciate her copying me on this email, but she says there was a letter sent last night directly to the BZA email that I'm not sure Mr. Henry has a copy of, but would certainly be relevant. I have no idea what that is. I've not seen that, such a letter. So I'm, I'm just praying upon you know fairness here I uh, want to be sure that the BZA has every piece of evidence that's pertinent. Right now, you don't. And it seems like it would be a waste of everyone's time to try to conduct a hearing today without without all of the evidence, evidence in front of you. So, so uh, Mr. Henry, this is David Taylor again. Um, in, I guess, the um, in, in, in the case file, we have three letters from people who either owned the home or uh, lived in the home, they said. One is from Susan Chambers, who lived there from 2002 to 2007 and said it was uh, a completely single family home while she lived there. Um, the next was uh, Ms. Eastgate, who lived there from 2007 to 2020, who said that it was their single family home. And then her daughter, Caroline, wrote in and said that she only lived there from 2007 to 2016, and it was a single family home. So you're wanting to, to find out additional information from Mr. Eastgate, is that what you're looking for or what? Mr. Chairman, importantly, I think I, ha I have only seen one of those three letters that you just mentioned. I just went onto your website to see if there's a, a, a listing of the documents that you've received. There's not a, a docket, there's not a board packet, filed on your website. The only thing on your website on BZA Tracker is a 15 page appeal application. Okay. I received a letter from the Neighborhood Association. I understand John Summers, uh, Mr. Summers attorneys representing the Neighborhood Association. I received a, an email from Becca Rands uh, yesterday at 1240 PM. But you're referring to information that we haven't even seen. I have no idea what what prior owners other than the email attached to the neighborhood association cover letter by Mr. Pickney. That's the only thing I've seen relative to a prior owner. Okay. Uh, and then Henry, how much, uh, uh, is that something that you would be able to, uh, to review and be ready for our next meeting? I, I hope so, Mr. Chairman. I mean, you've got two attorneys on your board. Uh, generally it takes, it takes a little bit of time and we've got a filing deadline to work with. So, right out of the gate, we're talking about less than two weeks, right? If it's the next meeting. So it gives me about 10 days. And uh, I, I, until I see the, until I see that evidence that you're referring to, I, I'm not sure. I, I hope so. There's been a lot of people involved here on the site, working on the site, and, and they probably have some information as well. Engineers, contractors, I haven't had a chance to speak with those folks. So is there is there is there work being done as we speak on the on the site? Not that I'm aware of. And so so your client would have no objection to a, a stop work order until we heard the case if you were to defer it. My client would be would voluntarily agree to uh, ceasing all construction activity. But let me say this: there's two parts to the allegations being made here. One of them, is, uh, one is, somebody's asserting that there was never a legal duplex on this property. Yet we know from a public record that, it, that the tax assessor has re recognized it as a duplex since at least 1999. If, if the appellant will stipulate that it was a legal non-conforming duplex and all that we're gonna talk about at the board hearing coming up in, in two weeks or 30 days is whether or not it was lost, whether or not the right was lost by a cessation of use, then yeah, we're we're happy to to do a quid you know quid pro quo, stop everything, um, no further movement of any sort. But there's I just want I just want you to realize there's two there's two elements to the charge here. They're asserting that it was never a legal duplex to begin with, and secondly, even if it was. 
that right has been lost. I think it'd be more efficient if we don't have to litigate whether or not it was a legal duplex to begin with, because I think the facts are very clear on that. But now we got to prepare for that case too. Okay, uh, Ms. Davis, you had a question? No, Mr. Chairman, I was just raising my hands for when you were ready to take comments from all of us. So if you have more questions okay. or something that you would like to say, I'll wait. Ms. Carpenter, did you have a question for um, Mr. Henry? Um, yes, I do. Um, Mr. Henry, when you, um, if we do um, grant the delay, uh, when you come back to us, will you provide us with um, what the zoning administrator was given um, for his analysis? Is that something your um, client will be providing us? Well, I, I think you have all of that, but certainly uh, whatever we have, every public record that we can get our hands on, we're going to submit, and maybe anything we can learn from the private sector, from individuals who know how the property was used, we will provide that to you as well. So we've got a, a lot of, we've got, I'm, I'm building information here, and we're certainly going to give you everything that's pertinent. Okay, and also, um, I believe Ms. the chairman mentioned um, stopping work on the property. Um, and I will say I do drive by this property um, often, um, living in the neighborhood. And I know per our board um, rules, we're supposed to disclose that. And that's it. Mr. Pepper. Uh, yes, Mr. Henry, in your letter, you say you were retained February 8th, so you've been retained now about a month, and if we give you another two weeks, that that gives you six weeks, which is, is um, a, a fair amount of time in my estimation. Is there any reason that you were not able to, to begin the investigation uh, when you were retained in early February? I, I've, I've continued to receive... Uh, information from, again, my client, who is the innocent purchaser of Unit B. He's owned it now since last summer. The information that's necessary here is information that is not in his personal knowledge, right? Because the question is, the, the question predates his ownership. So he's having the hard time of having to go back and find information that other people have and reaching out to people that precede his ownership of unit B. So it's been a challenge. And and it's it's not if it were if, if my client were the owner during the period of time in question, this would be a lot easier. But we're having to reach out and find people who have knowledge of how the property was being used before he ever owned the property. Okay. okay. Well and I, you know I, I think we've always been erred on the side of giving people continuances. I, I'll repeat what Chairman Taylor said, which is I think the evidence in the record right now, I don't know what you're gonna come up with, but it's pretty overwhelming that the non-conforming use ceased for over 20 years at this point, because there, there is a an unambiguous statement by a previous owner that to that effect. So is there, um, well, that, that, that's all I had, thank you. Well, let, let me just say to that, there is serious credibility questions about the veracity of that email statement and the motivation for that email statement being submitted in this case. I don't want to go any deeper into it, but there's public records regarding the, uh, the two parties that lived and owned on this property. And so you need to be aware of, of some of that information relative to the credibility of the person making that statement. Are there any other questions for Mr. Henry? Mr. Henry, did you have anything else to add? Mr. Wallace, did you have a question for Mr. Henry? Uh, Chairman Taylor, you're, there is a lot of uh, feedback coming back when you're talking. I don't know if anybody else is hearing it, but I am. Is it is it better now? That's much better, yes. Yeah. Okay. M Mr. Henry, can you articulate um, and I know you can, it, it's whether you can, if you want to or not, but can you articulate the hardship upon you as counsel in presenting your case other than distance time and, and you've got a out of state client in this particular instance? I mean, you do, unfortunately for you, you do have a couple couple lawyers on this thing and, and 
I'm just trying to put my arms around it, if you would, please, sir. Sure, and, and just to be clear, appreciate the question. To be to be clear, my client is not out of state. My client is is here in Nashville, and again, he acquired the property after the time period that is being challenged in, in this appeal to your to your body. The one of the prior owners lives out of state, and I understand that my client had a conversation with him, but I have not yet had an opportunity to have a conversation with him. And so there's factual in, there's factual information there that we need to understand that we need to secure and, and understand. Uh, so you're looking to acquire sworn statements from party witnesses that won't be available. That, that's correct. Okay, that's that's exactly what I'm seeking to accomplish. Didn't mean to jump in there and and spoon feed it. I just wanted to put it into something for the record purposes. Any other questions for Mr. Henry? I believe at this time we will hear from uh, Ms. Nickens, who was the appellant. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Great, thank you. Hi, nice to meet you. your name and address. And yes, thank you. My name is Lindsay Nickens. I live at 4107 Murphy Road. This house has been in my family since the 1930s. I'm the proud owner of it um since this past year um and i can speak to everything that mr henry just addressed but let me just start off and we really do need to be focused on the facts here um number one the appellants completed all required tasks before the deadline put forth by the board including all mailings signage to notify the neighbors this would also have given mr barr adequate enough time to secure Mr. Henry and any said evidence that they needed on their side. There is reason the board has a deadline with precise directions. In addition, the appellants are neighbors. We are certainly not paid to be here, and we are certainly not speculative developers in Sylvan Park who stand to make hundreds of thousands of dollars off of misleading the board. We have taken off of work, we have canceled medical and mental health care patients to be here today, and we've arranged child care. So I humbly, that's not the last thing I have to say, but I humbly ask you to take this into consideration. Mr. Barr, who has been before this board before, was contacted by Joey Hargis, a codes member in January, and was notified of the item A appeal, and that if he continues, it would be Mr. Bar at Mr. Barr's own monetary risk. Since that time, because I am the neighbor that lives next door, Mr. Barr and or his associates affiliated with the project have continued to do work on the pro property as late as last Thursday, February 25th. So we certainly do not understand how they are asking for an extension. Mr. Barr proceeding with this is being extremely disrespectful to this board and the neighbors of Sylvan Park and shows that, that this is his grandiosity in our opinion. Number three, the appellants have concerns that if Mr. Barr is granted an extension at the property at 4109A, it could be sold to another owner, right, 4109A, who's now owned by David Ramsey. And Mr. Ramsey and Mr. Barr are affiliated and friends, by the way. I can speak to that as well. What would become a 4109B if all of its permits were revoked? Would Mr. Barr then get to continue his project by default or perhaps bring a lawsuit against the city, which I believe is something that we all want to avoid? In fact, I think this extension, because he continues to do construction work and has so since he was notified of the appeal verbally, I, I'm, I'm not really sure why would we be granting this to him. If our evidence is not compelling enough and the board would like to offer more time to the other parties to bring additional evidence, that's completely your decision. Now, let's go and back and address Mr. Henry's points. Okay, the facts of the matter are as follows. Mrs. Susan Chambers, who owned this property from 2002 until 2007. So if I'm gonna do some math, that's certainly longer than 30 months. And then we go move on forward past that to the East Gates. Both state that this was not used as a duplex. It was a single family home. 
So even if we don't have any conversations with any of the Eastgates, which we have, we have Mrs. Chambers' written affidavit, which Mr. Henry should have, uh, stating that. That's, that's certainly number one. Number two is Mr. Eastgate has been in touch with us. And in fact, I would have Mrs. Rands speak to this, certainly, because she was on the phone with him. But what I will say verbally is what I have been told, and so it would be better coming from her, as that Mr. Eastgate actually wanted to speak directly to the board because someone, either Mr. Barr or his affiliate, someone contacted Mr. Eastgate, asking him to sign documentation to assert that there was some type of tenant living in that building. This is what I've understood. So he was actually uncomfortable writing an email. His ex-wife, Mrs. Jody Eastgate, as well as the daughter uh, that lived in there, are both attesting to the fact that it was never used as a duplex in the time that they were there. But nevertheless, I, I don't think that we should get distracted from the point that even if none of that evidence was there, you still have the one piece of evidence from Mrs. Susan Chambers. Okay, so I believe that that's that's pretty much all I would have to say. And I would say that we have we have done our best. We have spent our own personal money. We're not getting paid for this. This you know I have been a, 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 in this neighborhood. Okay, I've lived away, but this was my grandparents' home. I know this neighborhood. I've spent my own money. I do not want to see it, see it be, be torn apart by developers. And right. I wish that you were on video. And ma'am, we're just yes. Yeah, and and again that that. I appreciate your those uh, uh, opinions. We're just here to talk about whether we yes, do it or not. Facts, yes. So, uh, but we would humbly ask that you take this into account because we have taken out off work, and and quite frankly, we think that even with the one piece of evidence, we have enough to really discuss this today. Okay, Mr. Lawless, did you have a question for Ms. Nickens? Okay, so I'm just making sure I'm doing the balancing act that we all have to do at this point in time. Ms. Nickens, what what I'm hearing you say is that it would be a material inconvenience for the witnesses on be on your behalf or on your side of this equation. Am I correct? Yes, sir. To and actually, well, I mean, you don't have to go into a whole lot. I just need kind of yes or no. Yes, sir. Kind of, yes, sir. Kind to of, everyone involved. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm just trying to pull it down because we'll we'll spend more time arguing over a continuance than we probably will over the case. Um, so you heard Mr. Henry's comments that he can't adequately prepare his case before us, and you obviously have a difference of opinion. Um, what suggestion do you have? How do you split it? How how do you want us to act? I mean, we're I realize that you're not getting paid, but you have a financial interest in it. You might want to know that the members of the board, the BZA, don't get paid, but we do it because it's our sense of community duty. So balance those out for us because we kind of need to hear it all at the same time. And I don't mean, Mr. Chairman, to overstep my bounds. And if I do, please put me back in my place. It doesn't hurt my feelings. Um, <laughs> how, yeah. would I, how would I suggest? I mean, listen, I'm all about being fair to everyone involved. But let's go back again. I'm not sure who just spoke. So I would call you by your last name. Humbly, I am pointing to the fact that what he does have in front of him, even if he has a issue with Mr. Eastgate not having an email in, okay, I actually think that that will only hurt his his case, but um, based on the additional information, Mr., uh, which Ms. Rands can speak to, uh, even if we take them out of the equation, you still have enough factual evidence here to hear this case, is what I'm saying. Susan Chambers' email affidavit alone, okay, more than 30 months and that goes back to 2002 2002 to 2007. so right. what i am saying is i am not about being fair but the, the point is is that we're, we're kind of getting my stay on the facts that this is the fact are there any other questions for ms nickens all right then uh ms carpenter Oh, yes. Could you describe more uh, what construction is going on on the site? I 
like I said, I drive by this um, property often and I can't see into the backyard and it sounds like you um, you can. So can you enlighten us on what's going on? Yes, ma'am, uh, absolutely. So um, yes, my, my back window actually looks right over into it. Um, there is a driveway that has been constructed, which goes across the creek. And thus far, it looks like they have placed some pipes. Now, this has actually happened in January, probably about the time he was verbally notified. So he still broke ground and was putting pipes in, um, looking, you know, it, it looks like to me, water pipes. Uh, this past week, like I told you, I think it was uh, both Wednesday and Thursday because they blocked access to my federal mailbox. Um, they were digging uh, water there. So that was going on for two days. Um, and of course, they're do continuing to do some type of work here and there on building a bridge, I believe, over the what I call this is what I grew up with. It's called the creek, in my opinion. I think there's probably a more professional name for it. Um, but that has all been going on since this the, new, the beginning of this year. Okay, thank you. Any any more questions for Ms. Nickens? All right, and I will. Uh, I, since this is a, just a, a motion to defer, we've heard both, from both sides their cases, and uh, so with, the, with that, I'll close the public hearing and have the board discuss uh, whether or not we uh, defer the case. And you know, I, I think Mr. Pepper is correct, and and that you know, often when you know, when a side, especially you know, the property owner ask for a deferral it's it's uh, it's not uncommon in fact it's it's almost regular that we would offer that um i'm sorry but hang on one second I, I, there are two appellants in this case there's uh, yes sir and yeah and miss rands is available to speak if you would like her to ma'am and I, 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 thank you hang on with me uh, I'm, I'm juggling a little bit of information here, but I believe that she's she's not listed on the docket, but I believe she's an official uh, appellant. And so I'll I'll give her a, a two minutes uh, to speak. Again, uh, Ms. Rands, only to the issue of why should we should hear this case today rather than uh, at, uh, at another meeting. Uh, if you are here, please state your name and your address and, and specific for why we should hear this case today. Sure. My name is Becca Rands. I live at 4111 Murphy Road. And, you know, I don't need to go into any more details other than just to say, um, you asked Lindsay what was fair. And, and to me, what would be fair is to hear the case today. And if you still feel that there is enough information that we are lacking, or that the other side could be lacking at this point, um, that could really change um, the outcome, then at that point, allow for the deferral. But we've taken off work, we're here. Um, we have been, I, I mean, I have spent hours upon hours preparing for this um, and tracking people down and speaking with them. And you can see it all in there. My husband and I, you know, we've written it all out for you, all the people we've spoken with and gotten letters from. And I think the fair thing would be um, for you guys to look it over. And if you say, hey, I think, you know, if uh, Mr. Henry spoke with Mr. Eastgate, it would change the whole thing, then great, that's that's fine. But but um, just giving us our, our chance to present uh, what we have. And if you feel there's something missing and um, then then that's okay. All right. Any any uh, questions for Ms. Rands? All right, thank you. Uh, we'll reclose the public hearing. And as I was saying, I think that this is a case where you know we we often defer to um, the request for the deferral, but at the same time, um, in my mind, I always weigh that with with you know, is there a remedy for the other side if we if 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 we um, if new information is provided or whatnot and as Mr. Pepper had mentioned too, I mean, it's there's fairly overwhelming um, evidence in the case file. Um, you know, again, a, 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 unless it's fraudulent, uh, and and I have no reason or no evidence to suggest that uh, at this point there is 
fairly substantive evidence that um, the home was single family from 2002 to 2020. And I'm not sure other than a sworn statement, which is not something that we have ever required from this board. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, what, what could be a, uh, be found to uh, to refute that. And and I guess the question I ask is if, if we were to, um, you know, uh, allow more time, what would it be? I would say it at most the next meeting uh, with a, a condition that, that there's a stop work order and no additional work to, is to be done on site. Um, but I also am, am really not sure uh, what, what could be heard. I will say though, that we don't have uh, our board packet uh, used to be online. And I think that that's an issue with Metro, uh, the technology department. Uh, I would love for the public to be able to see our board packet. I think it should be online, but that's not uh, within my pay grade to decide. Uh, but I do, uh, I do respect the uh, Mr. Henry's um, issue with having not seen some of the things that we have seen in our packet. Mr. Pepper? Uh, yes, I'll try not to beat a dead horse. I agree with you. I, I empathize with Ms. Nickens. I know that it's a lot of trouble to get everybody together. And I, I would ask them to understand that, that part of this process, that this happens often to probably hundreds of people since I've been on the board that have, have showed up and something has been deferred. It's just part of making sure everybody that there's a fair hearing. And I, I do think Mr. Henry um, does need additional time and, and we all, we've all we always erred on the side of giving that. And I'll make a motion that we um, defer for till, until the next meeting provided that construction stops. And I think that constru stopping construction is warranted in this case because there has, it, it, Mr. Henry wasn't just retained a week ago, he's been on the case a little while, and also I, th I think the um, the evidence right now on the record, I just don't see. Uh, I think Mr. Henry should be given a chance, obviously, and we'll we'll look at whatever evidence he brings forward. But as the record stands right now, there's pretty overwhelming evidence that this the non-conforming use ceased for 20 years. So I'll make that a motion. Uh, we hear it at the next meeting, uh, provided that construction is stopped. Is there a second? There's a second with the only caveat that the stop on work on the project be mandatory. I mean, not just uh, we will we won't do any more work on the site. I don't necessarily agree with that. So I think there needs to issue a stop work order until we have our our hearing on this but i do think we need to continue it until our next meeting so that is a condition is that acceptable mr pepper yes i'll amend my motion accordingly miss carpenick did you have a a comment or a thought for amending or just um it wasn't about the motion i just wanted to point out that uh, mr chairman you are um you move this case to the top and i think you are trying to accommodate um the neighbors and i am sorry um that the neighbors feel inconvenienced but i think you you've done a good thing by moving it to the top of the docket today well thank you and, and that was the intent i knew a lot of people were waiting and 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 i knew it was not unusual for us to to defer these. And I also, again, back to Mr. Pepper's uh, comment, uh, that the case file is, in my opinion, fairly overwhelming. Uh, and again, no, noting too that, that the information that's presented is new information to uh, the zoning staff as well. I mean, I, I, um, you know, this, the, the decision to issue the permit was not made with the information that we have now in hand. Um, and so I, I think the motion I, I, I support the motion. Uh, is there any other discussion on the motion? Other thoughts from board members? If not, then uh, we'll call the question and start with Mr. Pepper. In favor. Mr. Lawless. In favor. Mr. Newton. In favor. Ms. Karpinek. In favor. Ms. Davis. In favor. I'll vote in favor also. and. Note that we absolutely expect to hear this case uh, in full at the next meeting. Uh, Mr. Wallace, did you have a? Yeah, just the one thing, if you would admonish Mr. Henry to make sure his clients 
comply with the stop work order if they haven't physically received it in their hand because that that will obviously have a bearing if they continue to uh, work on the site. I think I think we all have a pretty strong opinion on that part of it. Absolutely. So, so done. All right. So uh, with that, uh, we will move forward to the first case uh, on our docket, which is case 230, I believe. The first case we're considering today, 2021 I'm sorry, 2020 230, located at 1331 Baptist World Center. It's an item A appeal challenging the zoning administrator's interpretation of eligibility uh, for use of adaptive residential development standards within an SP zoning district. The appellant is seeking to convert an existing building into multifamily townhomes. The parcel map showing the SP zone parcel an aerial view of the surrounding area, the proposed development, and the existing site. At this point, the zoning administrator would like to read a statement into the record. Can, can, can I, I just say one, one comment? I, I like looking at Ross Pepper's name on my screen, but I'm not seeing the exhibits that you're putting up, Lisa, if you could. Yeah, I'm not either, so I, th I think I think we get Ross on here. We haven't got anything else. I will work with IT to, to correct that. Thank you, ma'am. I've been seeing a lot of Tom Lawless on my screen. <laughs> While awaiting that's those that's exhibits, I'll go ahead and make my introductory comment for the case. This is John Michael, the Metro Zoning Administrator. With regard to this case at 1331 Baptist World Center Drive, the bottom line question that the board will be asked to answer today through this item A appeal is whether or not this particular SP is, quote, non-residential district that permits with conditions a residential use, end quote. Um, for all that I say, that is still the question. At the end of the hearing, you'll have to answer one way or the other. Um, it's been a journey to get to this point, as I will quickly say, kind of in deference and on behalf of the appellant, we had this previously scheduled, but a day or two before the previously scheduled hearing, we on the staff side thought we had an administrative resolution that would work for them and let them uh, withdraw the case or set aside the case, defer, however we structured that, regardless, basically said, you don't need to proceed. We think we've got this figured out for you, but it turned out we didn't. We thought the question was going to be as simple as, can you utilize Metro's adaptive residential development ordinance in conjunction with your SP project? The answer to that is yes, and we thought that was going to be enough to take care of them. However, the more pointed question and issue for them was whether or not within that particular ordinance they could utilize one of the bonuses contemplated at Metro Code of Law 17.16030F3. That particular portion of the adaptive residential ordinance speaks to bonuses for density and floor area if in fact the base zoning district is, quote, non-residential district that permits with conditions a residential use, end quote. Here's the analysis that I went through on that in determining that no, it was not, therefore setting up this item A challenge. It's an SP zoning district, which in the beginning makes it weird, right? You don't see a lot of SP cases because they are exclusively administered by the planning department through its planning commission. However, the question in issue really does go back to an interpretation of zoning code, which per law is the unique province of the zoning division and more, uh, more specifically the zoning administrator. Like most SPs, this was a time consuming process. Our appellants today had to work for quite some time with the planning staff and go through the council process Process to get Council Bill 2019-59 through the process eventually substituted and passed by Metro Council with the support of the District Council Member, Council Member Toombs. Um, they put a lot of time and work into that, but after the fact, whether by design, whether because of changes to their plans, or for whatever other reasons, which honestly don't matter here today, they determined that they wanted to utilize the adaptive residential development standard and try to trigger the bonuses associated with that provision that I discussed previously. The trick here is determining then whether the SP is that non-residential district. It is and it isn't because an SP is an SP. That's the S part, SP 
specific plan, a plan that's been designed to be pretty much exactly what planning and the developer intends to be the case for the property in question, the uses that are allowed and that are not allowed. Any bulk regs or other development standards that might be in play can be and frequently are expressly outlined in these ordinances. Here, the ordinance didn't offer a lot by way of development conditions. In fact, just pointed to, as is the case with most SPs, which other zoning district would apply where development standards or bulk regulations are silent. In this case, that zoning district was MUNA. That's Mixed, mixed Use Neighborhood Alternative. So if the SP doesn't speak to something about setbacks, height, density, floor area ratio, ISR, or something else, then we're instructed to go back to the base zoning code for MUNA to see what those standards are. SPs in and of themselves aren't residential or non-residential, don't allow or disallow residential uses. So we have to go to any specifically identified uses within that SP or go to the underlying uh, provisions. You have in your, I believe, uh, an email that arrived today from the planning department. By law, they have to give us a recommendation one way or the other on a case like this when an SP is involved. And their recommendation came in saying what they thought about the case, that the SP district was not, in fact, one that opened this bonus under the 1716-030-F3 provision. Instead, because the SP is silent on these bulk regs, it goes to MUNA. MUNA is a mixed use, though not overtly residential district, um, and it does not uh, permit those residential uses as a PC or permitted with conditions use, but instead those uses are permitted by right in mixed use districts which necessarily flies in the face of that prescribed definition for eligibility for the density and floor area bonuses. Um, that's a big deal. We're looking at the MUNA district, which is the underlying description of bulk regs for this particular SP, and that district specifically allows residential use by right, thus does not allow the density bonus or the floor area bonus for uses on these residential portions of the project. Um, because they are not eligible, we determined accordingly here at the staff level, the appellant uh, properly appealed and we uh, kind of fast forwarded their previously filed appeal since they'd already given the proper notice on the case and got them to today's hearing. With that, I'll be quick to avail myself to any questions from board members, um, whether it be about uh, the SP, the MUNA zoning, or other components of how we reached our decision. Are there any questions right now for the zoning administrator? All right, we will hear from the applicant, and, and I think Ms. Shepard did, and, and, or Ms. Linton, I don't know if anyone announced if 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 uh, the public you wants to call in, and I, I get confused sometimes of whether you're you know if, what what it means if you're against or for. Uh, but if you uh, want to speak on behalf of the. Uh, appellant, then I, I think you should be calling in. Is that correct? Yes, the phone number is actually going across the screen for the public to view so they can oh, call nice. in. Oh, nice. So they can call in for that. And then, so what we, uh, the way this would work is that we would hear from um, from the appellant. Um, and then if there are folks that called in, we'll hear from them. And of course, the board members can ask uh, questions whenever they choose. And uh, if the appellant is present, I believe it's Mr. Rankin. Uh, could state uh, your name, address, and in this item A case, uh, the goal is to explain why the zoning administrator uh, erred. Uh, Chairman Taylor, this is John Rankin. I live at 1709 Woodland Street here in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, members of the board appreciate the opportunity to present our side uh, today to you. First of all, I, I just want to say up front that there's not a real dire consequence of granting this appeal. We're talking about between 1,500 and 2,000 square feet difference between the two interpretations. Um, our goal is, is not to expand in height, width, or length for what we have. It's only to end up really with three bedroom, two bath units that are really more functional and, and uh, more family oriented. Um, so that's number one. There's We're not talking about, you know, our, our SP has submitted is not 2,000 feet more than what would be permitted if we were MUNA. Secondly, I believe we're a unicorn. I think uh, John Michael would agree with this. Um, this is a very odd case. It, uh, at council, 
um, there was a substitute bill passed um, that was presented that that had the effect of restricting our residential use of this property. Uh, I think we're either the the last or one of the last rezonings before NS became available. And so the bottom line for us is uh, we're sure if, if you look at the sentence um, from the ARD uh, code, we're sure that we're a non-residential district SP. We're zoned SP. And I say we're non-residential because there's a list of residential districts and SP is not one of those. And therefore, if F SP was a residential district, I believe it would be listed as an option for residential. Um, it is not, it, it's, it's, a, it's got its own category. So I'm, I'm just going by the, the language of the code. And that is, we first have to show that we're a non-residential district. And I can show in the zoning code that we are not listed as a residential district. And therefore, I believe we're a non-residential district. I believe that's, I, th I think we all agree on that actually. Uh, but the second part is where we where we have uh, sort of a, uh, we don't understand each other. And the second part is uh, the interpretation of the zoning administrator is that we're able to use this property residentially without any conditions. So, and therefore the floor area bonus is not available. But that's actually not the case. Um, if, and I've in my in what I submitted, I submitted our actual SP bill, and the SP reads like this: Be it this is in section two of our SP. Be it further enacted that the uses of this SP shall be limited to all the uses permitted by the MUNA zoning district, which is exactly what uh, the zoning administrator referred to a minute ago except it says this, with the exception that. So what it's saying is you can use it as an MUNA with the exception that you can't use it for this. So our take on this, and just very, very plainly is, the interpretation given to us was that our base zoning underlying this SP is in MUNA. And so that district in its own self doesn't restrict our residential use, but ours does. Ours restricts it to the residential use, uh, everything in MUA, but being able to use it for short-term rental property. And so what I, our case before you is that we disagree with the zoning administrator that we're able to use this property as if it were MUNA because we are not able to use it as if it were MUNA. We can only use it with certain conditions. And therefore, I think we really do meet the standard in the ARD code. And I'll take any questions anyone may have. So you, I'm sorry, Mr. Ingen, are you saying that if it, if it were zoned MUNA, you would be able to do what you're, what you're doing? No, no, no. If it were zoned MUNA, that would be a residential district. It, it would also mean that we were able to use it as MUNA without conditions. And then we would never, we would never ask for this floor area bonus of 1,700 square feet. In this particular case, we, we, this particular case, we cannot use it as MUNA because we're conditioned to not being able to use it certain ways that you would normally be able to use MUNA. Okay, I, I'm sorry. I, I was just trying to understand the point you were at you, that when you said, "Be it further enacted, the uses of the SP shall be limited to all uses permitted by the MUNA zoning district," um, and I, I don't. With the exception, please, please give me a second. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm trying to. I, I see that with the exception of short-term rental, but I guess you know you, you've stated it. 
and I'm trying to understand it, but state it again. What's the point? I mean, are, would if it were if the use were MUNA, would you be able to have the floor ratio area ratio you're asking for or not? I'm not sure what I'm not sure what your point was in in reading that section. And I apologize, but if you could restate it again, but I, I'm, I'm feeling a little dense on it, and I just want you to understand why that was raised. Okay, um, the the ARD code says this, and that is, if if you are if you have conditions on your residential use, you may get a floor area bonus. And what I'm saying is, our SP puts a direct condition on our residential use, and therefore we're due the floor area bonus. Just simply, simply based on the existing, simple. simply on the existence of of a condition. Uh, even, even if that condition doesn't impact, I mean, the 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 the, the exception that you're talking about a short-term rental. I don't know how that would relate to floor area ratio. So you're saying it, it's the exception itself, not the fact that it relates to anything impacted by that exception. Chairman Taylor, if this was MUNA, we could use it for short-term rental. Okay, so but we can't use it for short-term rental and therefore we can't use it for all the uses that MUNA would normally provide. Okay. And because of that, they give you a floor area. Boot. Okay. Uh, that, that, thank you. Uh, thank you. So we're due the floor area boot. <laughs> Mr. Newton. Yeah, uh, so I, I was looking through the packet trying to find if I if I could see something here, uh, but you said it's seventeen hundred it's seventeen hundred square feet of a bonus. Do you can you say what the what the um, max is without the bonus? Um, our, our max without the bonus is our there's the square footage of the lot. I think it's like forty four hundred square feet. Okay. And you're asking for so it's about a thirty percent bonus essentially, or approximately a floor area ratio. It is. It's from forty okay. four hundred to about six thousand something um, feet right. for the entire site. And can you kind of just just explain briefly the the units you're you're wanting to build here? Yes, we have an existing uh, structure there. Um, that the goal was to renovate that into two units and then uh, add three others on completely. So there's a total of five. Um, and these are all, will all be three bedroom, two bath units um, with garages underneath. Okay. What do you know what the um, square footage of the existing structure is? Um, the existing structure is 1,200 square feet, it's 30 by 40. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, I was muted. Ms. Carpenter? Oh, um, actually, um, Mr. Newton um, asked my questions, or one of them at least. Thank you. <laughs> Forgot to lower my hand. Are there other questions for Mr. Rankin at this time? All right, Mr. Rankin, did you have other anything else to add? And Ms. Minton, we, we've lost this year's uh, I, presentation. No. Yes. Uh, uh, Chairman Taylor, I, I would say this is this is really complicated. It, it, um, it, it's just a really a simple case beyond the complication of re reading through the code and RSP. And that is really simply, if we could use it as MUNA, we would be able to use it for a short-term rental. But for the fact that we had an SP put on top of us, that restricted our use of the property with conditions that we're MUNA, except we can't use it as MUA, MUNA would normally use a piece of property. Then we're, we're since we lost that right, we're, we can avail ourselves of the floor air ratio bonus. And that's all we were, that's all we came to the table with. And I think it was agreed upon and then maybe someone, uh, you know, someone objected to somewhere within the system. And and so I asked if I could come back before the board. Okay. 
Are there any any other questions for Mr. Franken? All right, I, I do have a question for the zoning administrator because the one thing I'm I'm trying to understand the whole relationship with conditions, uh, the fact that there were conditions um, or exceptions. I'm not sure what the language was that impacted. Um, the floor area ratio bonus and and it does say in the uh, sp that there are let's see this well i don't have the specific language here but it it was saying you you can do everything but the um short-term rentals etc cetera, etc cetera. can you mr michael could you speak to that the shortest explanation is this mr chairman exceptions are not the same as conditions. And the conflating of those two words represents um, the, respectfully, what I would contend is the fatal shortcoming of the argument advanced by the appellant. Exceptions are, here's a list of the uses you can have in this, in this uh, particular SP, minus these few, and those are the exceptions, short-term, alternative financial services, beer and cigarette market, flea market, et cetera, et cetera. That's not a condition, those are exceptions from the list of land uses that are available. A condition would be something like, you can have this use if you're on an arterial street. You can have this use so long as you don't border zoning districts X, Y, and Z, et cetera. Even in the recommendation that you got from planning today, specifically from Ms. Berkland on the planning staff, the very last sentence of her statement before going to the formal recommendation for disapproval of this appeal is as follows, quote, the conditions in this bill are not use related. Whatever conditions are present aren't about the uses, they are about other bulk regs and frankly aren't on point with what we're talking about today. What the appellant describes as conditions, thus opening the door to this PC analysis under the applicable portion of the zoning code, are just exceptions from things that he can't do. That list is no part of the analysis of whether or not it's a PC use. If you look under the Metro Zoning Code at the land use table, and I know the architects and some of the lawyers on the board may have had to do so in the past, you go right down that little grid of, okay, here's my zoning district, and here's the long list of uses that might be available. Some are not allowed at all. Some are P, permitted by right, such as residential in MUNA, which is what's at issue here. Some are PC, permitted with conditions. That's why permitted with conditions is the phrase used in the ordinance because that's what we're looking for. Is it a PC use in that land use table? No, therefore it's not available. Um, I won't contend for a moment, taking two steps back, that this is somehow a, a monumental issue of horrible and grave concern for the city, for the department, for the builder, for the board, for anybody. It's an issue, we need to get to the bottom of it. But nevertheless, um, treating the word exception is the same as conditions or permitted with conditions is clearly inaccurate and represents the misunderstanding on this point. Um, sometimes I tell you if we could have gone either way on a case, but that's not the case here. This is one where we're pretty confident we got the law right. Happy to entertain any other questions, Mr. Chairman. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions for the zoning administrator? All right, Mr. Rankin, did you have anything else to add? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I, I, you know, I, I haven't been availed of the um, letter from planning that came today, or the email from planning. What I what I heard quickly was that the the, the stance was that this didn't affect our use of the property, and therefore it the, and therefore it's not. You know, we don't we don't meet the test. I think it completely affects our use. We cannot use it as a short term rental property. We, it affects our use as how we use it residentially. So where that last sentence, the words I heard was, you know, it, this doesn't meet the test because it doesn't affect how they use the property. I, I think that's exactly how it's affected us and, and enormously. And so I would just ask the board for some latitude here on, on, a, on a case where we, where this was put on us, we're in a situation now that we, that, uh, that for, for really no fault of our own, we ended up in, and all we're asking for, not to increase the size or whatever we would be able to do, you know, in, in, the, in the area, we're not asking for something, you know, monstros, some sort of monstrosity. We're just asking to be able to use the, the internal component of the, the, the footprint we have uh, to, to, to have um, several bedrooms. I, again, 
I'll come back to this. If if the if the if the case boils down to the last sentence I just heard from planning, that that it doesn't affect our use, I, I couldn't disagree more. That's exactly what it does. It affects our use as a, as a short term rental property. Thank you for your time. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Rankin at this time? Okay, um, uh, Mr. Newton. Yeah. So just so I'm making trying to make sure I have all this clear. Were you, Mr. Rankin, were you a part of the uh, the rezoning process to turn this into this SP zoning? Uh, yes, I, I was the applicant. Okay. In that process was essentially the floor plan that we see on a screen or on, on, right now. Is that essentially the, the floor plan that was presented through that process? Or, or, or was that? We've actually uh, reduced it. Great. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Newton, we've actually we've actually reduced it greatly from then. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I can present that drawing that we presented for planning. Uh, no, that's, that's fine. Thank you. Any other any other questions for Mr. Rankin? All right, Ms. Shepard, were there any callers? There are not any callers. No callers. Okay. Um, then I will close the public hearing and be grateful I've got architects and lawyers as my, my uh, co-commissioners. Thoughts on the case? Mr. Newton. <laughs> well, I'll speak as an architect and certainly not as a lawyer, with all apologies to the lawyers on here. Um, I mean, I, 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 I get that this might not be the technical legal application of the zoning code, but it does seem that the intent of the rezoning and the intent of the council member who helped that and who has supported this is for this development to happen. Um, and it's clearly in a rapidly changing post-industrial area. It's creating, you know, more housing that's badly needed in our city right now. And I mean, I, 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 I can't speak as much to the legal side of it and whether it's technically correct there, but it does seem to me that this was the intent of the council when they passed the uh, re the the rezoning to uh, the SP zoning. So I guess that that will be my thoughts. So I'm interested to hear from the attorneys. You have a much uh, much higher view of this than I do. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir, sorry. <laughs> Chairman. I'm sorry. Chairman Taylor, this is Ashanti. I didn't raise my hand. Is it okay if I talk? Absolutely. Um, so, um, I respectfully disagree with Mr. Newton's comments because I don't think we can read intent into the SP zoning. Um, I think it's sort of disingenuous for the applicant to appear and say, well, we don't get short-term rentals, so that means that the use has changed. The way that SP works, from my understanding, it's a very complicated process in which a developer who's building a project like this would go through planning, discuss what they want to do, what would work, what would not work. I imagine as some of our council people have, they put conditions whenever they allow sort of these larger developments because it falls without, it falls outside the residential zoning to say, hey, I understand this is a large development. I want to see growth in this area but I don't want this to turn into a short-term rental hotel, so I'm going to add that condition. Just because that condition was added doesn't mean that now it opens up all these, opens up something that isn't allowed. I think the argument made by the applicant and the zoning administrator did a really good job. It misunderstands the law. Just because you agreed, normally this goes through three readings at council. I'm, I don't know what at what point that condition was added, but... I'm sure there was conversations with the council person about adding that condition. Because that condition was added, it doesn't mean that now you're entitled to something else that you wouldn't have been entitled to. The short-term rental limitation does not correlate to the, the, the other condition that they're seeking. They wanna add 30% 
to a building. And I feel like because the SP is such a specific zoning, they should have added that when they were going through that process. You, I think planning owns this process. They're in the best position to make this decision. They recommended that we disapprove it because special zonings are so unique and they are such specific plans. And he's basically trying to route around planning and ask us to do something that we technically don't have the legal right to do. And I'm done talking. So Ms. Davis, your your recommendation would be that, that I mean, the remedy would be they just would need to modify their SP. Is that Exactly. Exactly. Okay. We're not the place to remedy SPs. If they want a remedy to their SP, go back to plan. Okay. Mr. Pepper? Mr. Pepper, are you muted? No? Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, I appreciate uh, the zoning administrator acknowledging this is not an earth shattering decision we're going to make. Um, I will say, I think the zoning administrator has it right. I read the materials and I followed uh, the zoning administrator's legal analysis. I can't repeat it. <laughs> I can I can understand it, but I can't articulate it uh, as well as he can. And I think it is a legally correct decision. I think Mr. Newton does make some good points, and I think the zoning administrator acknowledges those that this is not this is not a super consequential um, decision uh, as, as as some of the decisions we may go, but. I think that um, the zoning administrator has it right, and I also agree with Ms. Davis's comments and would am, am glad to make uh, a motion or support one. Okay. Mr. Lawless, did you have a comment before Mr. Pepper made a motion? No, I was going to back up and, and second the motion that I'm pretty sure I know where he's headed for, so I just got my hand up early. And, okay. But I, I do I, also I, want to say that I thought Ms. Davis couldn't have been more on point than she was. Yes, I understand the nice side of it, but we don't make the law. That's not our job, so. Okay, then I will go back to Mr. Pepper. Uh, I will make a motion that the zoning administrator did not err. Okay, there's a motion, Mr. Lawless. And I'm, well, I'm gonna let Ms. Davis second it. I don't mind taking second spot to her. Okay, Thanks, Ms. Carlos. Davis. Ms. Davis, second. I second it. Okay. All right. There's a motion. There's a second. And is there any discu more discussion on the motion? Then we will vote. Mr. Lawless. In favor. Mr. Pepper. In favor. Uh, Ms. Karpinek. In favor. Ms. Davis. In favor. Mr. Newton. I will say that Ms. Uh, Ms. Davis's uh, explanation persuaded me I'll vote in favor. All right, I will too. That motion passes uh, unanimously. Uh, next case, and assuming that, uh, and again, if the board, if you were all remote, if you need a break or anything like that, raise your hand and say, Mr. Lawless. Can we maybe take a break about four or five minutes? All right, yeah, a couple minute break. Uh, if you would, just uh, when you come back, if you'll hit your hand raise button, that'll signal that you're back. And um, we'll, we'll take a, a few minute break. See everyone in just a few minutes. All right, Mr. Lawless, you back with us? I'm back. All right, that uh, reestablishes our uh, 
that our entire membership is with us and we will hear the next case, which I believe is 31. Next case for the board to consider is case 2021-031, located at Zero Morningside Drive. Requesting a variance from the 10 foot side street required setback. They're requesting a three foot side street setback within an RS-10 zoning district to build a proposed single family residence. The zoning map showing the configuration of the RS-10 parcel. The aerial, oops, excuse me, the aerial view. The proposed development. This is the parcel zero morning side in question. The existing view and the view in both directions of the surrounding areas. At this time, we do invite members of the public to call into the telephone number scrolling across the screen to voice their support or opposition to this case. But at this point, the appellant may now address the board by stating their name, address, and presenting their case. Uh, my name is LaJuan Clendenin. My address is 1438 R.D. Avenue, Hanfield, Tennessee, 37216. And good evening, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, my goal is to um, develop the property consistent with the growth and development that's taking place, not only in this community, but the communities all over the Nashville area. Um, it is my belief that the variance I'm requesting will allow me to provide a home that fits the growth and add value to the community as well. Um, the 10 foot setback uh, makes it kind of hard to build a, um, what I would consider to be a reasonable functional home for a family. Um, thank you for letting me speak. Jessica, are there any calls? There are not. Chairman, we believe you're on mute. Well, I sure am. I just had really wise things. Uh, I was just yapping away for those that, uh, <laughs> those that have, have been listening. Those that that's not true. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Glenn, I, I just had a quick question and, and that was the, um, the, the, the side, but the setback request you have is, is for Morningside and you're asking for three feet instead of 10, but it looks like on the screen that we see uh, uh, before us that there is substantial land between your property line and Morningside. Do you have any idea how wide that is and how far your home would actually be set back from the street? Uh, I'm sorry, Chairman, I do not know how wide that is. Okay. It just, it, it appears to be, you know, if, if it's to scale, it appears to be at least nine feet because it seems like it's at least three times, you know, the, that little distance. But I was just curious to know if you, if you did, um, Mr. Pepper, did you have a question? I did, uh, Mr. Clinton, this looks like this is a 25 foot, uh, frontage lot. Is that correct? <laughs> You said it looks like it's a 25 foot frontage lot. It, it uh, I believe, I believe that's what you have in your application that the lot has 25 feet of frontage. Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Uh, the front is, the front is longer than that. Uh, let me see what I put in there. I'm, if I did, I thought you put 25 feet. It looks like 25 I, feet. The lot itself is 194 feet. I think it's more than 25 feet from the front to the oh, street. I'm sorry, I'm at, I'm at the frontage facing uh, Ben Allen Road. Yeah, you've got 164 feet or so on Morningside, yeah. as I recall. So, but you have 25 feet on Ben Allen Road. No, 25 feet is going across from Morningside. That's going to be from Morningside. The lot itself is 25 by 194. Okay. 
So was this, it, and what I'm trying to get at here, was this, was this a subdivide, was this a 50 foot lot that was subdivided? Yes, sir. It was. Yes. And did you subdivide it or have it subdivided? I did. After talking with Coles and planning, um, that they just suggested that was my best route. I'm, out for I'm, I'm sorry, you were breaking up on me. I, so let me repeat the question. Did you, did you have it subdivided? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right. I think you're on mute now. Ms. Carpenter, did you have a question? I did. Um I'm not sure who is on mute there. <laughs> uh, my question is, it appeared from the photos that there's an existing uh, home on this property. And will this new home that's going to be constructed um, be the same distance from the street as the existing home? Uh, no, ma'am. Will it be closer to the street or further away? It would be closer to the street. OK, do you know about how many feet? Uh, I don't know the exact footage from the feet, I mean, from the street. <laughs> and then I guess for, for codes, um, it was mentioned a minute ago that, that it, um, that the applicant, uh, subdivided the lot, but I think that the technical term is that he reestablished a lot line. I think the lots actually existed and it didn't go through planning. Is, Ms. Minton, is that correct? My understanding is the lot line was reestablished between the two original lots. They may have submitted the document through planning, but it's done by right. It doesn't require uh, planning uh, approval. Okay. So it, it's, it's, it's that same situation that's, that's really common in town now where you have two lots, maybe three lots that have been together for sometimes almost a hundred years, but technically when they were when they were developed it was really three lots that went in together to put, put one home on and now this is they, they just reestablished the original lot line okay so there were originally two it was originally platted as two two lots with 25 feet of frontage is that was saying is that right I do believe that that is the case. I do not have the original plat in front of me. Okay, well that that would mean it's not, it was it was not subdivided then, so that was okay. If you look at the zoning map that I've pulled up, you can see the the lines showing the original established lots. Right. The, the adjacent parcel it has the solid lines, and then it right. has the dash line in between, and that usually represents that. The solid line is the current configuration, but by right, they could reestablish those dashed lines if they have the original full lot, which is what this uh, appellant has done to create zero morning tide in this instance. Okay, thank you. Any, any other questions for Mr. Clendenning? <laughs> Mr. Glendinning, did you have anything else to add at this point? Uh, no, sir. Thank you, Chairman. I uh, appreciate y'all hearing my case. Okay. Um, then we will close the public hearing. We have a letter from uh, Council Member Nancy Van Rees, who uh, is weighed in saying that, you know, she's neutral on it, uh, concerned a little that it might be squeezing too much, but uh, neutral and defers to us uh, on the you know, on the hearing and any, any other thoughts from the board? Well, this is Mr. Pepper. I, th I think that the looking at um, the neighborhood plat, if you can put that back up, I think this is a uniquely shaped, um, you know, I guess how you, depending on how you look at it, but um, there remain uh, adjoining lots that do have more frontage, and this does seem to have I mean, 25 feet of frontage 
compared to 50 feet, um, which looks like most of them have, in my mind, it, you know, that is a that is unique and it's unique for the adjoining property. When compare, you don't have to go far to, to to find it to be a narrow property in comparison to others. So, um, unless I'm looking at this wrong, and I, I may be, and sometimes do, it seems like it's a there. That is a hardship. Yeah. Well, and I guess that I would ask, um, Ms. Newton, I know you have your hand up, so I'm going to ask, I'll ask you a question and then you ask your question or comment, but, you know, on the survey, you know, I get, you know, it's a, I guess it's a signed uh, stamp survey that, that looks like it has, you know, reasonable space. It looks like to me, it's at least 10 feet uh, between the property line and the street. And my only concern about a three foot setback on a corner lot like that one it's really deep in the lot so i'm not as i think the sight lines on ben allen and morningside are fine i think it's more of a safety and security and could there ever be a sidewalk there and it looks like based on this survey that it it's maybe 13 feet or so from morningside and if that's the case then you know i would have uh, less of an issue with it um but the question you know i guess to the architects is, am I looking at this plan uh, correctly? And is that, would that be your understanding of how much space there would be, uh, meaning, you know, enough for a modified sidewalk or, or some type, at least space between Morningside and, and the actual dwelling? So, Mr. Newton, not to put you, you on the spot, but I just I did. I read your mind here, actually, and that's what I was about to chime in with. Uh, um, it looks okay. like, just like, just looking at the the plan itself and just scaling off of that. And it's, you know, I'm assuming it's accurate. It looks like to be about 15 feet uh, between Morningside Drive and the proposed dwelling. Um, I did look and just looking on Google Earth, it looks to be about, it's probably about 20 feet between the existing dwelling and the street. Um, you know, so assuming all those are in the rail and they, they are usually pretty close. Um, it's about five feet closer uh, closer to Morningside than the existing dwelling, approximately. So, um, yeah, I, I I would say 15 feet would be enough for him to put a sidewalk in there. And just looking at the street, you know, the broad, you know zoomed out view, you, you know, it doesn't look like this would be a candidate for a lot of like road widening or something like that in the future. Just, yeah. Okay. Okay. Any any other comments or thoughts? or a motion or anything else I'm, I'm willing to make a motion that we approve the application mr lawless i'll second his motion have a motion I have a second is there any discussion on the motion mr lawless did you have discussion Hand, hand, hand and hand. I, I hit it twice and it didn't go down. <laughs> fast Sorry. All right, no worries. All right, so uh, seeing none, we will. Uh, I'll call the question and we'll vote. We will start with uh, Mr. Newton. In favor. Mr. Pepper. In favor. Mr. Lawless. In favor. Ms. Davis. Against. Ms. Karpenick. In favor. And I'll vote in favor. That motion passes five to one. And we'll hear next case. The next case, 2021-032, located at 2123 C 12th Avenue North, is requesting a street setback variance from the required 37.2 foot minimum front setback. And they're requesting a 25.2 foot rear setback for the proposed development of two single family residences on the property. Here's the, the zoning district map showing the, the parcel in the, within the R6 district. Aerial view of the existing neighborhood. Site plan provided by the appellant showing um, their proposed site. The existing parcel and the surrounding areas. Jessica, would you go back to the previous picture, please? 
Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. At this time, we invite members of the public to call in the telephone number scrolling across the screen to voice their support or opposition to this case. The app, at this point, the applicant can now address the board by stating their name, address, and presenting their case. Hi, this is Roberto Gutierrez, address 1916A, 16th Avenue North. Um, anyways, thanks for, uh, thanks for listening to me today. I'll try to make it quick. Um, there was a photo shown previously. That wasn't the site plan. That was the current survey showing, um, showing the site conditions, but there was another, the next page in the packet that I submitted did show site plan. Um, looks like it's not on there, but I can probably explain it from this. Um, pretty simple. Uh, Metro's alley is encroaching into the rear of the property by 15 feet. Um, it's not isolated to this particular parcel. It's pretty much down the entire block between, uh, I think this alley is shared by 14th Avenue North and 12th Avenue North. So um, what it's effectively doing is condensing, you know, the entire lot by 15 feet. So what we're asking is for um, and uh, front setback variance to be 12 feet closer to the street. Currently, the contextual setback is 37 feet. Um, and again, uh, maybe, maybe we'll be able to look at the site plan because I did submit one with it and it shows where we're proposing a 25 foot, uh, 25 foot two inch front setback. So um, scooting up a tad and the rationalization for that is that um, you know, 15 foot of the property is being taken up by the alley being paved incorrectly. Uh, that's the gist of it. And sir, we, we do have, um, we do have that site plan. Okay. Um, yeah, we do have that on, I think it's on page 39 of our packet for the board members. So, uh, we, we do have that site plan. Okay. Perfect. 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 And so, and what would your set, your setback would be 25, I guess at its shortest. And contextual is 37? Yes, sir, exactly. So, um, yeah, a little bit closer. Um, I, I know it is closer than some of the houses just next to it, but overall, if you look at the neighborhood, I don't think it's, it's, it's too out of character. Um, and we did look at some ways to, to shrink down the, the building envelope a little bit, um, and it was just it was just really hindering us a lot to where I, I think each of the homes was going to have to be about 40 feet deep and um, they were just going to end up much smaller than anticipated. So um, not trying to build a, a mega mansion here, but um, it, there's just the, the alley is just really hindering us. And um, how big are these homes? There are about 1800 square feet each. All right. And yeah, that, that's total square footage going up. However many stories they go up. Yes, sir. There are two floors. And then you have one that's 25 feet from and then I guess you stagger them because they're attached duplexes and the the other one looks like it's maybe 28 something like that and so you're just saying that as you go down uh two two parcels i know the contextual is what two two on each side but if you mm -hmm. go down three on three and four on on that one side it goes down to 26 and then 29 and that that was your point that it's um yeah it's not completely conflicting with the area or anything. Definitely understand that the uh, the parcels that are immediately adjacent to it are uh, a little bit further back. And you can even see from the parcel viewer that's up right now, if you look across the street, you can see how, how close those are. Those are probably like 15 feet. So um, yeah, just not, not largely in conflict with the character of the neighborhood. Um, and again, it's not like we're trying to go 3,000 square foot here. It's just that, that that alley is just really messing things up and it would be a uh, you know huge infrastructure project to uh, to change that and put it where the actual right of way is. Okay, and then how far from how far from the alley to your carport, how, how far, how much space are you providing there? It will be 10 feet is okay. what is what we're going for. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Mr. Newton. Um, so just looking at your site plan, the, that looks like the alley, alley does not conflict with your carports or your post units right now. Is that correct? That's correct because on the site plan, shows we're the showing yeah. the site plan is showing the units at 25 foot off of the street. So the site plan isn't showing it at 38. Okay. Um, if I had submitted a site plan with the same 
uh, floor plan as well as the same carport configuration, you would see it, it would be it would be in the alley and it wouldn't it wouldn't fit. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Lawless, talk about the trees, would you please? Uh, the trees on the on the lot currently. Yes, please. Um, all right. So currently, there's a large tree in the front yard. Um, we aren't going to get rid of that because well, we may have to trim it a little bit, but the plan isn't to take it down. Um, other than that, obviously, we would be planting uh, all the trees that are required per the um, per the city. You know, at least a two inch caliper tree for every fifty foot of frontage. Okay. What what is that? And, and I'm, I think it looks like it, here it says forty eight inch. I, so I'm trying to. Tell mm -hmm. what is it? Do you know? Uh, like what tree species it is? Yeah. If yeah, please. Oh man, um, I'm not. I'm not an arborist. I will admit that immediately. Uh, but, but I at least ask. And if yeah, you let know, me see. It's not, a, it's not a problem for me. I'm just trying to. <laughs> yeah, let me see. They, there's a chance I'm pulling over the surveyor. My surveyor may have. Every once in a while, they'll have like a. Yeah, they'll stick what uh, it is. Yeah. Yeah. They don't know. Unfortunately, they're not noting. They're not noting what it is. Um, so. I, I'm not 100 percent sure. I'd be guessing. No, that's okay. Your guess would probably be better than mine, but that doesn't. Okay. I would ask my other my other member, um, Mr. Pepper, since he knows more about trees than I do. Mm -hmm. um, I can't tell either. It's uh, it's a big tree at 48 inches of yeah, definitely. Diameter, so. Well, I can see based on just glancing back at my survey versus the site plan and looking at my contour lines there that um, it's not on the building footprint. So I could say that the uh, some of the limbs would definitely have to be trimmed, but uh, the driveway being proposed here is coming off the alley. So there would really not be any reason that, you know, to have to do anything more than trimming it. And um, there's a chance that we'd have to trim it anyways, even if we were... 10 feet back, but um, for what it's worth, you know, we don't, we don't try to get rid of, rid of anything unless we absolutely have to. Okay, Mr. Newton. Yes, uh, well, first to Mr. Lawless, this is, this is my very immature eye, but it looks to me like a, a water maple because based on the, the pictures that I've seen, because I have two of those in my yard and there, they are quite large, um, but uh, Mr. Newt, you have just supplanted Mr. Pepper as my go-to person <laughs> for tree. Okay, that's that's not a very good idea, I don't think. But my actual question is: um, looks like there used to be a house on on this lot. Can you, mm -hmm. can the applicant, tell us what the setback of that that house has been that was demolished was? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the house was demolished prior to us uh, purchasing the property, but I am looking at on um, on the parcel viewer. I can. It looks like I can still see the old overlay. It actually looks like it's um, man. And this is just a guess because I'm not scaling it. It's probably somewhere around 35 feet. It's. Um, Pretty, pretty similar to the houses to the left and the right of this. Okay, thank you. But I don't know. It, let's see when this was demolished. Yeah, I don't even see. Um, I can't even see that far back on the history. But um, yeah, it, it was already it was already gone by the time we we came into the picture. We didn't demolish it. Any other questions, Ms. Davis? Um, I was just wondering, so I understand um, the applicant's argument and I understand that it's, you know, the the contextual setbacks are kind of different on this lot. I'm wondering because of the houses beside you and this would be substantially in front of it, um, have you guys considered or thought about um, like splitting the baby? Like, would you still be able to use your plan if we, instead of 25, we gave you 30? just so that you're still a little bit closer in line with the houses around there. Cause it looks like to the, I don't know if that's to the right or the left, but it looks like the other houses are like 26.9 and 29. And mm -hmm. I, don't, I can't see based off your survey what the other ones are, but I was just wondering. 
Um, but I won't say I won't say not at all. I'd be lying if I said that. Um, it would be it it would be difficult. It probably require us to redraw the floor plan. The reason I say that is because the proposed unit A, so it's the one on the on the bottom, I guess, if you're looking at it, is about uh, six feet away from our carport. So I, I, I think if we got within three feet of that, it would just require, um, I think then then we have to consider uh, more of the fire codes. So, I mean, I, I don't know if, you know, financial is, is a great reason to tell you all, but I know that then I think we have to get into um, a lot more fireproofing and potentially removing windows off of the rear of the house and um, some other stuff like that. Um, not an expert on the codes, but I know that's why we try to keep it, I think, more than more than five feet away. And I think that's the same reasoning for most of the detached units in town being six feet apart. So that would be, that's what would make it difficult. Any other questions? All right, sir, did you have anything else to add? I think that's it. Just thanks for your time. Okay. Um, with that, we'll close the public hearing and ask for comments from the board. Mr. Pepper. Okay, well, I'll start. Uh, you know, there to me, this this is a is a hardship case because of the the encroachment of the alley uh, by 15 feet, and that if I'm doing my math right, they're asking for a variance of 12. So they're actually they're giving more than they're taking in terms of their request. So um, I think there's a hardship and. I think it's um, a, I'm inclined to grant the application, but I know I can miss things and uh, we'll certainly listen to other members of the board because I could have missed something, so. Mr. Newton. It, I, I would agree with Mr. Pepper. I do see, I, I do see a hardship in doing what they're trying to do. Um, I don't know. I'm having a little bit of, hard, of a hard time because there. I think there are other ways to accomplish having two 1,800 square foot houses on this lot that maybe don't require this variance. Um, so, I mean, yeah, with, yes, with these specific plans, then I, I do see a hardship there. Um, and. I know that Mr. Lawless is going to ask about this, and and if, if that water maple is anything like mine, it has a, it looks very large. It's 48 inches. Those have uh, very uh, uh, near the surface roots, and they actually come above the surface quite a bit. So I would have a hard time. That's that's going to really survive this, regardless of whether this variance is granted or not. Um, and I I would I would put the chances as slim. <laughs> My amateur eye on that. And um, yeah, this is David Taylor. Just uh, I need to ask uh, Ms. Shepard for the record if we had any callers call in. I, I apologize for not doing that before I close the public hearing. Were there any callers on the line? There are not. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just want just to make sure that uh, if there was anybody else that wanted to speak, uh, that we would hear them. And hear the, hearing that there are none, I will call on Ms. Davis. Thanks. Um, so I agree with Mr. Pepper's comments. Like I see the hardship here. And I also appreciate Mr. Newton uh, offering his perspective because I think that's what my question was getting at. Um, so thank you. Cause it's like, I do see the hardship, but I'm wondering if there's a way that we could grasp, uh, sort of give less of a variance so that those houses stay close. I mean, I, don't, I know that they wouldn't be able to be completely in line, but I just think it looks clunky when houses are in front of other houses like and you know you obstruct the view of your neighbors and this one's a little bit further up than the rest of the ones around it so i do think that a variance is warranted i just was wondering about the design and if there was another way to sort of give a smaller variance you know i was kind of looking at that uh too and 
you know, I, on, on one hand, I really appreciate the that the carport is 10 feet off the alley uh, or the, uh, I guess it says carport instead of garage. Um, and, you know, I know in, in, in my neighborhood, it's a historic district and it's very frequent that they allow a five foot um, setback from the alley, which to me is is really a tough to for cars to get in and out of. And but I do think, you know, if if everything was pushed back two feet and you had seven feet from the alley to the carport, then, you know, at least you would have 27 in the front, which would line up with the, you know, the existing residents. Uh, yeah, that there's a way to just, you know, shift everything without uh, without redoing. Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't think I don't know if that would require a, a, a rear or, or a back uh, variance or not. We could ask, but I. I, I I'm kind of agreeing that there should be some kind of maybe at least a little bit, if not not more. Mr. Pap uh, Mr. Pepper, Ms. Davis, had your hands are still up. Did you either have something to? No, I'm sorry. No, I'm I sorry. I did I'll not either. Mine down. Sorry about that. I'll take mine down too. Uh, other thoughts from the board? Well, all right. Well, what's the answer? <laughs> Well, I'm willing to make a motion. I don't, I, and I'm open to it being less than the 12 foot um, variance requested. I'm, I'm just not smart enough to figure out what, what that number should be less than 12 feet. Um, Mr. Lawless. Well, I was, I was getting ready to jump in there, but I'm going to do what some of our friends that are architects on this board that we sit due to us lawyers and i'm going to say surely to goodness gracious we've got several great architects on here they can they can help educate us lawyers real quick on what can we do because none of the lawyers are just <laughs> crazy about the, how to get us where we want to get to so yeah so putting, putting the architects on the spot would would uh hey they've done it to us david <laughs> they what yeah, uh, Ms. Garbinick. Well, I guess I've been quiet a while, so I'll give it a shot. Um, without really seeing their layout, it's hard to um, really weigh in on that. Um, so I would go with um, there's some other structures down the street that are 26, around 27 feet and 29 feet from the road, I would um, go with something like that. And I do see structures across the street that are closer to the road. But I do understand the point, and I also feel that when you do have a, a house that is sticking out in front of the houses immediately adjacent to it, um, that does create a little bit of a hardship on those particular neighbors, um, having to look out and see uh, someone else's home. But I will also say that it appears that maybe the request for the 20 feet, 25 feet from the property line is to a porch and maybe not, um, maybe the porch is, is uh, not enclosed. So I, I don't know. I, I don't see any, um, did I miss elevations here that shows us what that is? Um, so I guess I'm talking and maybe not coming up with um, <laughs> a really great answer here. So maybe Mr. Newton will will enlighten us too. Well, I appreciate that. I, I don't have a whole lot to enlighten other than I, I guess my question uh, would be, can we, would it, I, I would rather reduce the setback in the rear of the property to the I feel like that has less of a harm on the neighbors and reducing or to reduce it in the front of the property. You know, I, so I guess the question is, is, can we make that a condition of whatever, of whatever we decide here? Uh, you know, may, maybe we reduce the, um, the carport rear setback to being, you know, five or seven feet, maybe seven feet from the alley. Uh, as as part of this, and, and, and so that gives them some more leeway back there. Can somebody speak to that? Whether that can be done? 
This is Lisa Minton. If the carports do not have doors facing the alley, the code does allow for a five foot rear setback. If that helps for clarification. It, it, it does, but I'm guessing that they just looking at it. I don't see how you could have it other or is that mean if it's just open without you know, open air kind of that could be down to five feet? Correct. As long as there's no door for access from the alley, anything to keep the vehicle from getting trapped in the alley while the garage door opens, um, it allows a five foot setback. If they put a door on, on them, they become what we call garage ports these days. Um, it would have to be a ten, required 10 foot setback for, uh, I be, believe, the fire egress purposes. Okay. So with that being said, it seems like they could pretty easily move this whole thing back five feet and that would get us to 30 feet from the street, which would only be, you know, about five and then about uh, nine or six and nine feet in front of their neighbors. Uh, does anybody have any, th any thoughts on whether that'd be reasonable? The, um, the only, I guess the question is that if, if it is truly a carport and it, and that's the case, would we ask the applicant if there's a hardship, you know, if they, if they felt like that was a hardship? I think that's a good idea, Chairman Taylor. Okay. Ms. Carpenter, did you have a question or, or thought before we ask the applicant? Uh, no, I was going to ask Mr. Newton to make the motion and I would second it, but I'll hold on a minute here. Okay. Is the applicant still on the line? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks for uh, thanks for letting me speak again. I um, I heard everything you say, and I and I wrote down some notes. I, I won't take too long in the interest of time. Um, yeah, so these are supposed to be garage ports. That's why they're ten foot off of the alley. Um, building them as carports is just um, uh, almost defeats the purpose a little bit. I mean, it's a covered car, but then you know, privacy for um the homeowners kind of goes out the door where people can just walk in walk in and out of the garage from the alley um to answer i, I don't remember the the woman's name but the architect the there is a five foot porch off the front of these um but the part of the other front elevation um is in line with that so there are five foot uncovered porches but they don't i guess they don't jut out from the rest of the structure um but they're there are some insets there. Um, and then, yeah, regarding the the plan, I mean, the other way, the lot is 46 foot wide. So the, the units can't be as wide as what we see on the 50 foot lots, which are, which are a little more traditional over here. Um, you know, another option is to go three stories, but I, I feel like that would disrupt the neighbors even more having a really tall house next to them. And then um, there you start getting into uh, okay fire marshal codes and opening up uh you know room for the the largest trucks to get to get in driveways and all that so that's just kind of a i just don't want to open a can of worms with that you know mr newton well we had the applicant in the public area open um have you spoken to your neighbors at all to the neighbors on your side of this are they, I, are they no i I haven't. Um, on the left side, I've never seen anyone there. On the right side, I have. Um, I've seen some cars there from time to time, but um, just haven't haven't uh, been outside at the same time, nor have I knocked on the door. Okay. Any other? Uh, and so, is this? Un, is it? Un, is it? The, the when you say garage ports, that means that it has a garage door, but it's open. On the yeah, exactly. So on the it'll sides, have, it'll have a fence, and a, so basically, it's if you're walking down the alley, it appears private. But if you're hmm. coming out your back door, you're looking at a an open air, yeah, port, and it's the door that requires you to have ten feet. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's you still get the garage. The, alley the, alley from the property line, because it it sounds like the alley's in your. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. It's typically 10 foot. I think it's 10 foot off of the alley. But in this case, um, since it's encroaching, what we did on the proposed site plan is we're showing the garage door 10 foot off of where the alley ends. So it's really 25 feet into the lot, I guess. So if, if codes, I'm going to ask a codes question. Is there, is there, would it, would it go off the alley side knowing that he wants to put a, a 
garage port. I didn't know that that's what those were called, but um, a carport with a garage door on it, um, would his setback be from the alley or from the property line? It sounds like if it's... Does that... So the setback is from the property line. There's a dedication of right away um, that goes into effect here, but the final setback is required from, it will be the newly created um, property line after the dedication. The setback is related to egress. Yeah. Does that make sense? So it would have to be 10 feet off the alley Correct. that you've drawn it. If there's a door on the garage or the garage port, it will require a 10 foot setback. Okay, and, and from the alley, okay. Yeah, and if the alley was wider, then there would be a little more we could do, but it's, it's not like it's a newly paved alley. I mean, it's maybe like 12, 12 feet wide. I'd have to get the exact dimension, but um, yeah, even if we did get a variance to put it closer, it would really, um, it'd probably block the alley. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant at this time? Then I will reclose the public hearing. And is anyone more or less confused by what solution we should offer? Mr. Lawless. You know, I'm, I am looking at the slide that is up right now that Lisa's got for us. And yeah, there are houses on the one side of 12th Avenue that are closer to the street, but everybody on the side where this property is located is back a ways. And, and it just makes the, it makes it feel more open when you're going down it. I am familiar with this part because I do go through there from time to time. And I, I'm, I'm sort of struggling that they could move back a little, which is what I think everybody is saying, and I may be wrong with that, and maybe squash it more in the back. And I'm not hearing necessarily a willingness from the applicant to, to explore that a little bit. And, and I was wondering if I'm the only one that's picking that up today. I guess, I guess what I was getting, what I'm hearing is the applicant feels like they have, and this is the only answer, but, um, but, but, you know, that's just my take, but Ms. Ms. Davis, your thoughts? I was, I was going to say that Mr. Lawless kind of summed up how I was feeling about it. Um, and especially Mr. Newton's earlier comments about that there might've been potentially other designs, but, you know, I think this was a hard one and I think I do see the hardship, but um, yeah, it's just, that's it. Okay, any any other, Ms. Carpenter? Um, I'll just make a motion and we'll see how that goes. Okay. Um, I will move to approve a variance request of 30 feet um, from the front property line. Uh, with the hardship being the unique circumstance that the alley encroaches on um, the property. And I'm not sure how much was it, 15 feet is what was testified. And that would be, hopefully my 15 feet is correct. Okay, there's a motion, Ms. Davis. I second the motion. There's a motion and there's a second. Any discussion on the motion? Mr. Lawless, did you have discussion on the motion? Yes, actually, I mean, the, just on on the reasoning, I do want to at least point out that the applicant did acquire the property at least with the knowledge of the situation in the back. So, but this is, is as Ms. Davis said, it's a tough question and our friends in the architectural field didn't help clear the water, so to speak. They kept it just as muddy. <laughs> All right. So any other, Mr. Newton, did you have discussion? Yes. Can, can, can I ask that we 
give a um, amend the motion to allow him to go less than 10 feet on the on the back, even with the garage port, maybe seven feet or, or something like that to, to give him a little bit of flexibility there. I would accept that as long as Metro codes um, will allow that. Yes, that's a good point. Thank you. Ms. Davis, is that acceptable to you? Yes. Okay. So that uh, motion has been amended and is there any other discussion on the motion? Mr. Lawless. Can you simplify it for me, Mr. Chairman, just a tad? Uh, as I understand it, the motion is to uh, to grant the variance uh, at 30, uh, the front setback variance at 30 feet with the uh, condition that the applicant be allowed to, uh, if necessary, go to seven feet uh, from the rear of the property with the garage ports uh, based on all the testimony that's there. But the, the, the summary, summary is uh, the garage could go three feet closer to the alley and the house would have to have a front setback of 30. And so we may see this again if he can't pull off or codes won't let him do what he wants to do in the back. Is that what we're saying? That's right. Thanks, sir. Any any other comments? With that, we'll call the question and vote. Start with Ms. Karpenick. In favor. Ms. Davis. In favor. Mr. Newton. In favor. Mr. Pepper. In favor. Mr. Lawless. In favor. I'll vote in favor also. That motion uh, passes. So we'll go to case 34. Case 2021-034, located at 1912 10th Avenue North, is a variance from the minimum lot size requirements within the R6 district. Uh, the applicant is proposing to construct two single family residence. Here is the zoning overlay map showing the parcel. It's R6 zoning district. Here's the overview of the existing surrounding area. The survey provided by the applicant, existing site conditions, and the surrounding area. At this time, we do invite members of the public to call in to the telephone number scrolling across your screen to voice support or opposition to this case. Meanwhile, the applicant may now address the board by stating their name, address, and presenting their case. Thank you, Lisa. Hi. Members of the board, uh, Dwayne Cuthbertson, 409 Merritt Avenue. I'm here representing the owners of 1912 10th Avenue North and their request for the variance of the minimum lot size required to permit the two dwellings on this property. As Lisa pointed out, this property is on R6 and it requires 6,000 square feet in order to permit two dwellings. Uh, the property is incredibly old and after a survey, we found that it only had 5,664 square feet, as you can see uh, on your screen, that's 5.6% short of the minimum required. And this property, along with this neighborhood, was created way back in the early 1900s to accommodate you know, varying residential growth. And while the surrounding neighborhood contains mostly 50 foot wide duplex eligible lots, it also contains uh, a small number of smaller and narrower lots, not dissimilar to ours. Uh, in the immediate vicinity, a number of those substandard lots do contain two family dwellings, some of them actually on this block. And uh, those substandard properties and duplexes are similar in nature to the conditions related to our request. It appears most of them are legal non-conforming. However, in 2018, uh, this board granted a variance identical to our current request to allow two family dwelling on a substandard lot and that lot being exactly identical to the one in front of you today. That variance was granted to our next door neighbor, the one just to the south at 1910 10th Avenue. Um, and that lot is now developed out. You can see it in one of those images that Ms. Minton provided. It's got a house behind a house. Um, 
So our request is essentially to mirror that pattern uh, established next door as it relates to scale, orientation, parking, setback. And to that end, we commit uh, to all vehicular access and parking located in the rear. That uh, it's, a, it's a pattern that's found throughout the neighborhood and it allows us to maintain that continuous sidewalk uh, without uh, driveway interruptions in front of the property. And, uh, I understand that trees are important to some members of this board. Uh, so we've talked to the neighbor to the north, immediately north of us, and uh, he, they want those two large hackberries that are found on our north property line taken down. They want to put up a privacy fence. Uh, the one in the front, it, it looks like it's going anyway. Um, and so we agreed to work with them on taking those two trees down, but again, knowing that trees are important, uh, to the neighborhood, to this board, we are committing to planting uh, two trees in the front and two trees in the back, and we'll make sure that at least two of those are large canopy deciduous trees that you find on the uh, urban foresters list. So the summary really is it's our 33 foot wide lot being just you know 5.6% off from what's needed uh, after we surveyed it. That's the unique hardship. Um, Given that this hood was this neighborhood is traditionally composed of 50 foot wide lots, uh, you know there are a few similarly narrow lots in this immediate neighborhood, and many of them are just are just duplex eligible, or they're just under the minimum required, but then they're legal non-conforming and have uh, two houses on them, and that's exactly what we'd like to do. Uh, the two homes that we're proposing they wouldn't be injurious to the neighborhood as we're proposing. Uh, I think it'll complement the neighborhood pattern and. We do have some letters of support that should be in your packet. Uh, the additional house that we're asking for, we think provides very much needed, although it's just incremental, it's much needed additional housing uh, to address our city's uh, real affordability problem. And we think it also adds just one more household to the viability, to support the viability of Buchanan. So that ask you to approve the request and we'll stand for questions. Yeah, Mr. Cuthbertson, this is David Taylor, and it looks like from on the screen that we see now, and and based on your testimony, is that this lot in, uh, is unusual to its neighbors, and that the neighbors uh, are all are all large for the most part. I think you said with few exceptions, most lots in the immediate neighborhood uh, certainly are zoned for uh, two family, but also have the square footage. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Most are 50 to 40 feet wide and, and have the minimum required, but there are a number that are under 40 feet, uh, but have legal non-conforming duplexes. Okay. Any any questions for the applicant at this point? Mr. Lawless. Um, the price point for these duplexes just ballpark me. Um, um, I know, I know, and I apologize for asking that question. You know, front to backs over there, and I have to admit, Mr. Lawless, I've not been keeping up with the market in this particular neighborhood, but I ballpark, I'm, I'm going to say they're probably going for around 400. Jeez, okay. I can Maybe tell even a little higher. Yeah, understood. And, and I do compliment you. I, I compliment you on your knowledge of the trees on the lot. <laughs> I learned. You did well on that one, and you know my opinion of backberries, so. Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Newton. Yes, does, uh, and I'll, I can't really tell from the submitted site plan, but does unit B, is, does that, is that going to face the alley? Is that plan to face the alley, or will that face Tenth Avenue North still. It it actually faces Tenth Avenue North, and it it'll be it's it, it's you can't really tell. It'll be slightly shifted, um, and there will be a walkway down the sideway side of uh, the front house, okay. and there'll be a walkway to the back as well. So the front house can get to the small parking pad in the back. The, the rear house can get to the sidewalk on Tenth. Okay, so both of the parkings, all the parking will be in the back on the alley. All the required parking will be off the alley, but there's a lot of street parking available on 10th. 10th is actually a sufficiently wide lot to have street parking. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? All right, nothing and anything else to add, Mr. Cuthbert? No, sir. 
No, sir. All right, we will close the public hearing. I'm sorry, Jessica, uh, were there any uh, people that called in? There are not any callers. All right. Um, thank you. And so with that, we'll close the public hearing. And thoughts from the board? Mr. Pepper. Uh, yes, I think that uh, th this is a uh, deviation that is very low, 5.6%. I think this property looking at the subdivision plat is, it is in the minority and that it is smaller. So I think that that justifies a hardship and being it's just 5.6%, I would approve the application and am willing to make a motion um, or um, okay, so and I'm willing to hear from other people too, of course. So that, that's a motion to approve? Yes, I'll make it a motion to approve. Okay. And I will second it, Mr. Chairman, that's lawless. Okay, have a motion and we have a second. Now, any discussion? Ms. Karpenick. The applicant said they would plant the, was it four trees? Um, yes. I don't know if, um, if, if uh, my other members who um, talk about the trees would want that to be in the motion. <laughs> Just a suggestion. Yeah, suggestion, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> I like trees too, but I'm just throwing it out to you all since trees have been talked about a lot and the applicant has um, expressed the willingness to do that. I I'm willing to amend my motion, Ms. Karpenak, if you, if, um, if that's what you want me to do and, and require the applicant to uh, plant the four trees that he uh, stated he would plant. Is that acceptable to you, Mr. Lawless? Absolutely. Okay, that motion has been uh, amended. Any other discussion? All right, seeing none, we will call the question. This time start with Ms. Davis. Ms. Davis? I'm sorry, I was on mute. I vote oh. in favor. <laughs> All right, in favor. Ms. Garbanek? In favor. Mr. Newton? In favor. Mr. Pepper? In favor. Mr. Lawless? In favor. I'll vote in favor also. That motion uh, passes six to zero. And thank you. Thank you and good luck. And uh, next case is looks like 39. Next case, case 2021-039, located at 4020 Estes Road, is an item A appeal challenging the zoning administrator's decision to cancel a building permit within the RS-20 zoning district. The zoning administrator asserts the permit was issued in error because the garage cannot be used as living space. The zoning map showing the existing RS-20 zoned parcel. aerial view and the street view of the property. At this point, the zoning administrator will read a statement into the record. Members of the board, John Michael, the Metro Zoning Administrator, with regard to the property at 4020 Estes Road, the first thing that I need to tell you will be the last thing that I tell you. This is an RS zoned property and has been since 2002. The structure in question was built in 2007. Literally at no time has that structure ever allowed a dwelling unit, meaning a residential dwelling unit in it, whether it was for a family member or otherwise, whether it was for short-term rental or otherwise, whether it was for friends with no money changing hands or otherwise. The zoning has never allowed a second dwelling unit on the property since that rezoning in 2002, ergo, this structure, which was originally um, attempted to be permitted in 2007 and later permitted for a period in 2008, once built, um, was built as an accessory garage. A uh, garage not to be confused in any way with an optional dwelling unit, but just a garage. Today, what's allowed under RS zoning for that structure would be non-dwelling uses, a garage. To use the common uh, recent phrases, a man cave or a she shed. 
it could be the most fantastic lawn tool shed in the whole wide world, but it can't be even a modest dwelling. The building permit was recently issued by our department here at Metro Codes in late 2020, as noted in the letter submitted by the appellants, which to my understanding absolutely correctly captures the timeline associated with their work on the property during their time of ownership. I believe that's the letter dated um, January 19 of 2021 from Blue Piers. For us, we quickly recognized that was an errantly issued building permit. We are, of course, obligated to cancel the issuance, issuance of that permit once we catch the error. The error being the permit sought was to make renovations to the residential dwelling unit but they can't have a residential dwelling unit. So in all likelihood, long before the current owners of the property came into ownership of 4020 Estes Road, a prior owner, whomever that may have been, probably started using it as such, marketed it for sale as such, thus causing, at least in part, the Lupiers to buy the property so that they could use that second structure as a dwelling unit. However, it's never been allowed. It's not legal, and barring a zoning change, it won't be. So... We have an errantly issued permit, which has since been canceled. To the extent the item A case is a challenge as to whether or not we were wrong or right to cancel that permit, we'll have to let the board decide. Uh, you know the reason by which we did so. To the extent the real question becomes an item A challenge regarding the legality of the dwelling that pre-existed their ownership in the backyard, the law is very clear. The fact that somebody didn't know or did it in error doesn't mean that it becomes legal or thus allowable. It's still illegal. And finally, even though this is structured as an item A, it kind of devolves into being a request for a variance from a use restriction on the property. Here in RS zoning, as we've said, you cannot have a second dwelling unit. That's the very nature of single family zoning. And obviously, the board is not legally allowed to ever even consider a use variance. So although the case is not styled that way, that ultimately kind of becomes the question before you is, is there some way that we can allow this use that the law doesn't allow? It would fly in the face of the Bay Zoning Code, and it's also a type of relief that this board is not legally authorized to give. So did staff err in canceling that errantly issued permit? The zoning administrator on behalf of staff contends, no, we did not. Naturally, I'm happy to field any questions from the board members. Mr. Lawless. Uh, John Michael, I'm going to assume that it is a separate, a totally separate and complete dwelling unit. Illegally Correct. Not, situated. Not an attached structure, but a detached structure. It's a detached structure that's got use facility for someone that's living there full time. The the appellants will be best uh, suited to speak to the particulars of what's inside. Obviously, I've not walked the building, but um, their, their desire to obtain a permit to do some renovations were to basically upgrade the living facilities there. Yes, a reasonable want given what they knew at the time of the application. And Mr. Michael, is it possible? I mean, is it, would it be legal if it were somehow attached through a no. Uh, no, a smart question, but no, the law, the Metro Zoning Code treats attached and detached two family dwellings as the same. Okay, the fact that it has, yeah, that it, it's, it's not just a, a walkway to the rest of your house, it's considered a separate dwelling unit. This would do correct. Uh, and that's a, actually a poignant question given this particular block of Estes. As I'm sure the uh, property owners know, and maybe some of the board members know, years ago, and I don't mean 100, I mean less than 20 years ago, when I was a younger singular man, I've had a number of friends who lived up and down Estes in some of the traditional little duplex units. Maybe, you know, 1,200 square feet per side, but a traditional attached duplex unit. So um, that's been there on that very block, on that very side of the street in the recent past. However, regardless of whether it is two separate structures or attached, our law treats it as the same, a two-family use. Okay. Any other questions for the zoning administrator at this time? If not, then we will hear from uh, the applicant. Uh, what state your name and address and help us understand the situation and why the zoning administrator, in your opinion, is, is incorrect. So my name is Steve Lapeer at 4020 Estes. 
and my wife Susan's here with me as well. Um, we asked for we when we submitted our application for the for the renovation of the of that area. We're actually putting a pool in the backyard, and the, and the main use of that is going to be a pool house. Um, but in our application process, we asked exactly what we were trying to do was add another bedroom, bathroom, uh, renovate the kitchen. Um, and we're granted that. So if you walk through the building today, it would be down to studs and all completely renovated, ready for rough in inspections. Actually, um, we knew no different that it wasn't when we bought the property three years ago, it was marketed. And I think we put it in our. Uh, packet that it was marketed as a guest house with actually they told us it was potential rental income. Um, we have no intentions at all of having it as rental income. We don't want anybody living in our backyard. We we have elderly parents uh, who are aging and thought that it might be nice if they become not dependent anymore. They need to live with somebody that they come with us and still have a little bit of independence in the back of our property. Okay. And when you bought, was, was this, uh, I guess this, it's a dwelling, I guess, did when, what, when you bought the property, did it have kind of, I, I wanted to call it an apartment, but it, I don't know what, I don't want to get anybody caught up in, in technical language, but it, there was, there was a dwelling space back there that had a bedroom and a shower and a kitchen and all that. Was it, that was all that when you bought it? Yes, absolutely. And and li like I said, if you looked at the Zillow report and the MLS from the when we bought it, it stated that it that uh, that is such. That's how it was listed to us. And that's when we bought the property, we said, great, it's got a you know, it's got place for our for our uh, parents in the future. And since we're putting in a pool, we wanted to modernize it, update it from when it was done and make it what we want it to be. And the fact that we were granted the permit and I went to work, we literally spent thousands of dollars so far to get it to where it is only to be told that it's not able to be used that way. Okay. Um, any, any other questions from the board at this time? All right, Mr. LaPierre, is there anything? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Newton. Yes, uh, just just to clarify, what what are the spaces that you were adding to the existing unit? So originally, the house, the the it was a two car garage that we have taken both garage doors down, and I've made a, a basically a ensuite master bedroom and bathroom on the main level, so that they don't have to go up and down the stairs. The two bedrooms that were in the property when we bought it. We're both upstairs and we didn't want our, our parents to have to go up and down stairs if they decide to come live with us. So we, we've, we've taken out both garages and we're going to put one small garage door back on one side to make it still storage area, but it, it's like a golf cart garage is what it would be, be fairly small. Um, and that space that used to be the two car garage is now a master bedroom, bathroom and laundry room all on that main level. Okay, so but you're not adding any square footage to the existing no, structure? No, no, not adding any square footage whatsoever. What we planned on doing in, in part of the application was to put a carport on the front of the unit so that I could still park because I lost my parking spot, right? I used to park in that garage. So I was going to put a carport on the front of it so that I could keep my car under cover. Okay, thanks. Mr. Lawless. Okay, so so if I understand this correctly, the house when you acquired it in this detached building uh, had bedrooms upstairs, kitchen facilities that, upstairs. Kitchen facility was downstairs, and the full bathroom is downstairs. Okay, yeah, but it had and the it bedrooms, had two upstairs. bedrooms upstairs. Yeah, two bedrooms okay. upstairs. Okay, and. The people that you bought the house from, did they use it as rental property or did they lease it or anything like that? Or have you I, leased it? No, I've never leased it. No, I have no idea um, what they used it for. I, in all honesty, I used it as storage. It was, it was, I've got, you know, I do woodworking and whatever out in the garage, but I parked my car out there and, and the rest of the building was used as storage. 
um, for the for the last three years. Now that we're putting a pool in, we're saying, hey, we want a pool house. We, we don't want people going in the house to go to the bathroom or take a shower or whatever after, after getting out of the pool. So that's what we were doing with it. And again, our parents are getting older and we want them to be able to have the flexibility to have a have living space with us. Okay, did you ask either the realtor or the closing folks, the closing attorneys or what have you, when you bought the house, what you could or could not be or use that property for? We didn't because it was listed that way. The the again, Zillow and MLS both had it listed. The listing agent had it in there as if it were able to be living. It was marketed as living space. It was a guest house, is what they what they called it, um, with a garage or with um, bedroom, two bedrooms, full bath, and a kitchen. Is how it was marketed. So, I guess there was no reason for me to ask anybody else. You know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go buy a new house and go. Hey, can I live here? I, I understand. I'm just. I'm only assuming to, I can't. Well, I, I'm. I'm. Okay. When you then you may have just paid cash for it, but you may have applied for a mortgage like most normal yeah. folks do, and was got a mortgage for it for sure. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to pre, you know, I did not want to presume one way or the other. I would if it was me. So, uh, uh, but but when you listed in your loan application, did you list it as a detached rental property or a detached anything like that? No. Nothing is, in all honesty, I don't recall. But nothing as a rental property. Okay. Uh, How was it? I've, you never, I, you know, the, the day I moved in, I had friends calling, hey, I got somebody who wants to rent that garage in the back. I, absolutely not. I don't want anybody in my backyard. I've got I've got a couple of big dogs and we don't want that in the backyard. So, yeah, that's that's why your friends wanted them in your backyard, not not <laughs> theirs. I noticed so, uh, that that also being said, did you have a copy of the appraisal given to you at closing? probably did i could it's probably on my computer um but not in front of me i can't i okay and, I, and, imagine, and I know i had to have an appraisal on it yes right I, i'm and i'm not trying to pick on you i mean you it, it's a it's a heavy ask because we can't do some of the things that may be necessary but I, i'm i'm just trying to get my own mind around it thank you sir sure. you're welcome thanks miss carpenter I have a zoning question. This is not for the applicant, but um, is a pool house allowed in RS zoning? And if so, is a bathroom with a shower allowed? Yes, accessory structures are allowed within the zoning district and the shower is allowed in the accessory structure. The covenant gets recorded saying that it will not be used for, for living purposes in the RS. Okay, thanks. Any other questions at this point? Okay. Uh, Mr. Lapeer, did you have anything else to add at this point? No, but I, I do appreciate your time today. Other than to say that it's going to be an extreme financial hardship on me that, that we, after being given the permit and I've gone through the work that I've done, to have to put it back to the other the way it was is going to cost a lot more money, right? So I've done a lot of demo and put it all together and done all the work that we've done done to this point, and it's going to be a big hardship to have to to not be able to move forward with how we wanted to do the building. It, had we been told no in in the front end, I would have probably still asked for a variance, but I wouldn't have any money involved in it at that point. Right. Okay. Um, Miss Shepard, were there any callers? There are not. Okay, uh, with that, we'll close the public hearing uh, and and discuss. Uh, Mr. Newton? Sorry, can you reopen the public hearing, please? I had one other question. Okay, uh, yes, I'll reopen the public hearing. Ms. I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand, Mr. Newton, I apologize. And I was, it was last minute, it was last minute. Uh, and ask Mr. Lapeer a question. Okay, um, have, you, have you talked to your neighbors about this? Are they, do they have any, you know, I didn't see anything in the packet, but did, did they have any, you know, reaction, responses, thoughts on this? I did talk to four neighbors, the the folks immediately behind me. Um, they're actually, they went in Florida and he called me when he got the notice and asked me what we were doing. Um, he was only concerned that he saw the pool being built. He was concerned that we were building something else 
in the middle of the backyard. Um, he was concerned with sight lines, and I assured him that, that we're not changing any square footage to the property. All we're doing is renovating the interior of it. And then the folks to the, if you're looking at the house to the left of us, which is the uh, this garage abuts their property, um, they had no issues with with uh, us doing what we were asking to do. Okay. Um, yeah, the, so the two two neighbors immediately next to us that are right next to this uh, detached garage, we spoke to both of those folks, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Then I will close public hearing again and ask uh, for thoughts on a com maybe a complicated case. It's certainly complicated in terms of um, equity, which I know is not something that we uh, are always able to consider, but it sure does seem to me that we could work hard to find a grandfathered or some 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 method to allow something that was there when the homeowner bought it to stand, especially since they're on an acre and um, don't have any opposition and, and it's been there for 13 years now. but. Mr. Pepper. Uh... Sure. Uh, yeah, I agree with you, Chairman Taylor, and I think that um, it's unfortunate for the Lapeers. I don't, but I, I don't, and I think I'd like to try to find a way to um, make this equitable for them. I just can't find that the zoning administrator erred. It's just very clear to me that that didn't happen. I know that in the past, we have grant we have we have granted many variances where there has been an existing structure in use, um, and and this has been apparently used for quite some time as a essentially as a as a as a detached dwelling. So I wonder if that isn't the avenue that uh, the Lapeers could pursue. Well, I th and we can ask the zoning administrator. I, th I think that that what it was pretty clear that. If if we were to look at this as a variance, it would be a variance for use, which we're not allowed to do. And so that's why I was thinking that that maybe you know an approach um, that you know said that it was uh, because of the unique circumstances of the way it was advertised, the way it was purchased, the way it has been used, that that the zoning administrator erred because it was effectively grandfathered. Um, and, and that might be a path, but um, you know, I, I I think that we're we're just simply not allowed to vote on a variance on this type of property because that would be a variance for use. But I, I don't know. Other th Mr. Lawless. Okay, it there there's every once in a while where you don't get to do what you want to do. In this instance. They had folks that sold them some property. They misrepresented it. They just flat ass lied to them. They relied on it. Uh, and as a result, they may have a claim against a realtor or the previous sellers or the closing company or whatever. And as much as I want to help these folks, being probably closer in age to the people that they're trying to build this dwelling to support. Uh, I'm all for the concept, but I don't, you know, clearly John Michael did not err. Because, and, and just because I want to do something that we're not empowered to do makes it real difficult and just I'm I'm just cautioning that that yeah what what I want to do I, right now there's not been anything put out today that lets me do it and so I guess that the the question to the zoning would be you know I guess if they reason they would they have to get like an SP or you know I mean I guess the the question that the homeowner had would be you know hey I was given a permit I did all this work. I mean, is there, and it sounds like that you could have an outbuilding that had, you know, a, you know, the, the bathroom and that kind of thing, but it sounds like they could, they could keep it in some type of state of limbo if they don't finish off the bedrooms or they block them off for storage until they got it rezoned. Um, 
so I mean, I guess is is there a is there a a path there? And and it may just be that there's not, but I sure would want to explore all the paths possible, uh, Mr. Newton, and then Ms. Davis. I think some of my questions were answered, and that's kind of on the, the legal path of this, because I, I agree with with Mr. Pepper and Mr. Lawless. I mean, I, I like uh, this. This is a tough situation, but I was wondering. You know, I agree that it doesn't seem like the zoning administrator erred in revoking this permit. You know, you know, but I also I appreciate the applicant being forthcoming and honest in this and that you know if he had said this room was a say a studio or a she shed as mr michael said um then we wouldn't even be here talking about it it's just because he was honest and said it was a bedroom is the reason we're even here talking about it so i don't know if there i i you know i would be interested in hearing from zoning folks on what what those other options are for us here So were you asking John Michael a question? Uh, well, I, I, well, no. I mean, I think I, I think I know the answer because, um, I, I, like Mr. Wallace, Ms. Pepper said, I, I I don't think the zoning administrator erred in 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 revoking this permit. So sorry, was, I, I'm I'm working through it in my mind as I talk a little bit here. Mr. Lawless. Could there possibly be, if they sought to change the use, and I guess this is something that John Michael can help us with, that there not be a permit issued for them to use certain parts of it, you know, like they couldn't have restroom facilities in it, or, or they couldn't have the upstairs to where it had any access. I'm, I'm trying to find the middle ground that that Mr. Pepper was was mentioning, and I think we all want to try to find something for him. But I don't know how, without the creativity of John Michael, and some people may not think he's very creative. Unfortunately, I disagree with that. Um, he's not the dogmatic person that some people say he is. Um, Gosh, I wish I could see your face right now, John Michael. Uh, but is there some way, maybe, is that while they make their application to change the zoning? I, I mean, I'm I'm throwing something out there because right now I don't see that the zoning administrator erred in what he did. Uh, this is John Michael, the zoning administrator. In response to your kind of line of question there, Mr. Lawless, and I recognize that it dovetails with the inquiry that Mr. Pepper was implying as well. Um, here's how I'll answer your question. Were I a private sector attorney representing this property owner and billing a smooth 650 an hour like Mr. Lawless, I would probably advise the following. Number one, pursue a zone change. Work with your district council member and the planning staff to make sure that you kind of find a zone, and it may have to be an R zoning district rather than an RS. It may require an SP. Or it could be that there is one of the overlays that could possibly work for the benefit of this particular property under this circumstance. The, um, I'm sorry that I don't know the status of a council bill that's been considered regarding overlays for uses of detached accessory dwelling units, which is what this would become under some circumstances in the right zoning districts. However, with just base RS, residential single family zoning, it's kind of a non-starter, so the rezoning is one of the main ways to get there. There is a very ugly option that virtually nobody would think is a good idea, but is in fact a legal option, and that is doing an expansion of the house so much that it basically becomes attached to this de presently detached structure and basically absorbing it as part of their house. Um, the appellant has already spoken to the expenses taken on to this point. Who, buddy? I just spent a lot more of your money if you go down that road. But you do subsume that exterior, that detached structure, make it merely part of your house, and I don't care who of your friends and family come and stay with you in that scenario because it's just a large single-family house. Those are the two main ways that you could get to legal. And Mr. Lawless, you asked the right question. That's a several months-long process. So what could be done in the meantime? 
that could be a pool house, that could be a storage facility, that could be a hangout spot. What it can't be is a place where a human being sleeps overnight. That's a dwelling. And um, that's the main thing they want to get it ready to use. The presence of bedrooms or showers or bathrooms, not against the law. Um, but somebody staying out there and in a dwelling as their overnight lodging, not just hanging out during the day to watch a ball game or paint some art, that, that's the big difference. Um, if you have like a more nuanced or fine version of questions to come out of that, I'm happy to answer them. But that's kind of the best I could come up with. So I, I guess the bottom line from what I'm hearing, Mr. Michael, is that they, they can uh, proceed with at least part of their project um, then as long as it if they've convinced the, uh, the, the people examining it that they will follow the law and have that as uh, an accessory building but not a dwelling, then they can continue and then for them to really finish it out as with bedrooms and that kind of thing, or and finish it out in a way where it convinces the uh, the codes folks that are inspecting it that it's not a dwelling unit that they would need to uh, have the zoning change as you were are talking about, or the SP or that type of thing. So it sounds like it's it does sound like there is a reasonable middle ground to pursue a more complicated option for them, but at least a path to get to what they want and. And, and and agree with you at your decision, uh, which I think most of the members have expressed at the least right now that uh, th that they are agreeing with your decision. You've identified it right, Mr. Chairman. We would basically do a new building permit for the work to correctly identify the intended use. Um, we would probably require a fresh restrictive covenant that specifically addressed the intended use, more importantly, the uses not intended or allowed, um, so that that could be filed in conjunction with the issuance of this new permit that we would do in that scenario. And those those covenants, though, when if they, I guess if it had a, an, a let's say a SP or some zoning change, you know, when do those covenants go away? Or do, would you then have to the land? No, no. I mean, but if I if I signed a covenant saying, "Hey, my my man cave or my art studio will never be used for dwelling," and then codes changes and allows me to do it, effectively removed. Yeah, and very technically, it should be removed and uh, and thus taken off of what would come up in a title search. Here, I actually would be quick to defer to Mr. Pepper and Mr. Lawless, who've handled a few of these real estate matters. I suspect, and, and um, I guess I'm, in their recent history. I guess I'm I'm less interested in in how, but more interested in can that happen? I, if it's possible yes, for you certainly. to remove that when you have permission, and then I think that that's certainly an option or it's a pathway for the homeowner. Yes, it can be taken off. Okay. I, I do hope that the, the applicant is understanding how we're, we're groping and trying to frame the appropriate remedy here. And it's not easy. I thought this was supposed to be an easier trip this this month, this meeting. Oh. Are there any other questions for Mr. Michael or, or any other thoughts or comments? Uh, I'll, I'm, I'll make a motion if you're ready that we uh, that we um, uh, find that the zoning administrator did not err. And I think the zoning administrator has laid out pretty well uh, for the applicants, what's what relief is is available for them going forward, and and what steps they need to take. Ms. Carpenter, I'll second that. There's a motion and there's a second. Is there any discussion, Mr. Lawless? I just want clarification on the 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 second part of that. If we uphold the zoning administrators revocation that means basically they're going to have to go back in get another permit and work with john michael's folks to start it back up again mr michael is that the process this is lisa Minton. yes that is correct a new a new application will have to have to be issued okay so and then while that's being worked through the works they can grab a hold of their member of the council or the at-large member and and try to work the other route. Is that correct, Lisa? Yes, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Mr. Newton? 
Is there any kind of waiting period they have to go to if, if, if it's revoked? It's been... No, the permit was canceled, so they'll just apply for a new permit. Okay, okay, thank you. And I, I guess the other, the, the, it sounds like where people are going is, in, in, in the, this is a question of codes, is there any other condition that we could put on it to make it easier for this applicant? Because we all recognize the, uh, I'll say unfairness, and I don't want people to take the, the, you know that the wrong way. It, it just seems like it's a really unfortunate and, and, and unfair situation that the homeowners has found themselves in. And I would like to, and I think my fellow commissioners would like to remedy that as best they can. So is there any other, uh, you know, if, if they already paid for a permit, do they get that money back? Is there anything that we can do to basically say, hey, you got to start over, but we want to make this as easy as we can? Uh, zoning in zoning we cannot um, um, accommodate any refunds that would be done with the permit inspection staff upstairs but we could definitely reach out and contact them um, but it's on my end if they'd like to email me tomorrow I can uh, start the application for them tomorrow so that they can proceed with it as an accessory structure if they'd like to okay all right thank you mm -hmm. all right so th there's a motion and there's a second is there any other discussion on the motion all right, with that, we will, uh, I'll call the question and we will vote. Start with Mr. Pepper. In favor. Mr. Lawless. In favor. Ms. Davis. In favor. Ms. Karpinek. In favor. Mr. Newton. In favor. And I am sadly in favor as well. And that motion passes. And we are on to our last page. Well, that means we were denied. Oh, they're done. It is disconnected. Yeah, it is. <laughs> you it up? Mr. Yeah, you're still there, Mr. Lapierre. I'm sorry. All right, looks like muted now. Last case. The, the next case is case 2021-046. It is a short-term rental case appealing the I'm sorry, they're requesting an item A appeal challenging the zoning administrator's denial of a short-term rental permit. The appellant operated after the issued short-term rental permit expired within the R10 zoning district. The appellant is seeking to apply for the permit sooner than the one year from, from the date of the last operation. The zoning administrator will read a statement into the record followed by um, Mr. McBroom stating the specifics of the short-term rental case. Mr. Chairman, John Michael, Zoning Administrator. Um, we received an email today from the District Council member, Emily Benedict, who has been engaged on the review of this particular case, and she asked that we read her letter into the record today as she was unable to join in on the call after the meeting started. Um, case 2021-046. This applicant explained to me that she missed the renewal deadline last year due to the same reasons that other permit holders had trouble with in 2020, which include fluctuating employment and a pregnancy. I have had a hard time understanding how someone can forget to renew their permit when a short-term rental is crucial to their earning ability, especially with the extra efforts Metro now has in place to send both USPS mail and email for renewals. While I empathize with the appellant's concerns, I do not see a reason to reinstate the permit without some type of waiting period. Based on the records that the zoning administrator provided, they have never had complaints and they ceased operation as soon as they were alerted of the permit expiration. I believe the appellant wants to do the right thing, so I'd ask the board to uphold denial, but allow the appellant to reapply for their permit on the one year anniversary of the permit expiration rather than the one year from the date of correction. I believe this would result in an eight month suspension rather than a full year, thus reapplying on June 20 versus October 21. If the date that the appellant would be able to apply is June 20, then I would request you allow the permit to be reinstated now, which would be a gracious gesture from you. To recap, the city created multiple means of communication and works diligently to be available for questions. Although 2020 presented challenges due to health restrictions. I have not had any other cases like this in the district. I believe my recommendation is fair to the permit holders who have followed the law to a T while also providing grace to this responsible STR operator. I ask that your decision will allow the appellant to renew their permit on June 20 of this year or if they have been suspended since June of last year that allow them to reapply now. As always, thank you for your voluntary service to our city. 
Emily Benedict, District 7 Councilwoman. Um, now we'll hear from staff, namely Mr. McBroom. Good afternoon, board. Uh, Von L. McBroom, Property Standards Inspector, Department of Codes. On uh, May the 20th of 2017, they had first crawled. On June the 23rd of 2017, Type 1 owner occupied permit was issued. It was renewed on June 22nd of 2018 and again on June 21st, 2019. On December, uh, in December of 2019, there were three document stays, which were the last document stays according to host compliance tracking. On May the 6th of 20, notice of violation for no permit number in the website ad was sent by Inspector John Felt and the advertisement was corrected. On June 23rd of 2020, the permit expired. On September 21st of 2020, notice of violation for an expired permit was sent by uh, Campbell Paget, and the host compliance tracking does not show the date the ads remo of, of the ads removal. However, it appears that it must have been removed around the end of October 2020. Uh, 1029 of 2020, BG appeal was filed. There were no document stays after the expiration of the permit, and there were no documented complaints on the property. Okay. Any questions for Mr. McBroom? All right, is the applicant on the line? Hi, yes, I'm here. All right, if you would state your name and address and tell us why you're here. Hi, my name is Susan Walton. I'm at 15, uh, 1715 Marsden Ave, Nashville, Tennessee, 37216. Um, and we just want to get our permit back so we can start airbnb and and um, getting some income that helps supplement our family. Okay, and tell us what, what happened. Why, why did you... Um, to be honest, so I had gone on July like 17th to actually renew the permit. Um, and I have that date because I also like did my car registration at the same time. And when I went down to the office, I usually get it notarized and I renew it all at the same time. And when I got to the front desk, um, the woman told me, that the person who does the notary wasn't there and that it was fine and I can just come back at a later date. They were being pretty lenient just because of COVID and it's been like crazy in their office, whatnot. Um, so I, and this was after like waiting in line at like six, seven months pregnant. Um, and so then it just, to be honest, like we just didn't even have any Airbnb bookings, like pregnancy, trying to figure out like how we're even going to like pay for anything because we didn't have that income. And it like just completely slipped our minds. And then all of a sudden it was October and we were like, oh, shoot. <laughs> so it was completely our fault for letting that happen. But we just, we love Airbnb being and we need that money. And <laughs> we just have never had a complaint against us. When was the last time you rented your property? Um, oh gosh. I mean, with the pandemic, it just hasn't like no one. I mean, maybe in May, there may have been someone. And like, we've had like family and friends obviously stay here. Um, but no one for money. No, I mean, no one for money since May. No, not, no. Okay. I mean, all of COVID, I mean, yeah, since like March of last year, it kind of all shut down. Okay. Any, any questions for the applicant? Anything else, ma'am, you'd like to add? Um, I heard the councilwoman's recommendation to have us um, you know, be able to resubmit for our permit in June. Um, and that is super generous to not make us wait for the whole year. Um, I am requesting to potentially, you know, be able to submit for the permit um, this month or next month. Um, we would really, this is our private home. We don't, it's hard for us to Airbnb. We like go and stay at my mom's on the weekends. Um, it's, it's honestly a way for us to just pay for 
student loans. Um, we had to do IVF to have a baby and that was $25,000. So it's just, we would love to be able to do it sooner to kind of get some of that income back. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, of course, thank you. All right, uh, Ms. Shepard, are there any, um, Mr. Lawless, you had a question. No, I was gonna, well, yes, I guess I do. Uh, and when, when was the baby born? If you don't mind me asking, or at least give me a week or a, a, a time frame. Oh, December 12th. Okay, thank you. All right, Ms. Shepard, were there any uh, callers? There were not any callers. No callers. All right, any other questions for the applicant? Then I will close the public hearing and discuss. You know, I, I, I appreciate em, Emily Benedict's, uh, always appreciate her opinions and think is super highly of her. Uh, on, on these issues, I, I tend to disagree because I just think that if you do everything right and you don't rent after you know you've done wrong and you've gone through all the, uh, to me, it's just like you forget to, to renew your car tag. And if you forget to renew your car tag, you're not asked to not drive for a year. Uh, you make it right and you move on. And and I guess I've just always been hung up on, uh, on, on renewing a permit um, unless there's a documented bad behavior. I, I just have a problem with punishing somebody more than you would if you, you know, forgot to pay your your car tag or something else. That there's just not that deep a penalty in the city except for these things. But that's just my thoughts, uh, Mr. Lawless. Did you have a comment? I, well, when is the? And I know that you can say she could if if we voted it, we, she could apply next week or something like that. When the the permit expired in June. Uh, the council lady had suggested we allow her to reapply in June, which is not a year well, from the finding. She's yeah. asking for it to be a uh, sometime in March or April. Uh, and the last time she rented was last May. Right. Well, and, and, and I guess I'm saying she might have had just a little something else on her mind. Right. This is one of the few times, Mr. Chairman, you're going to hear me being more, more, much more on the lenient side. Um, obviously so okay i'm hoping i hear some earlier dates than june from my fellow commissioners miss carpenter i was going to make a motion but i do see other people in the queue so i don't know if you want to take those comments first okay miss davis um i was just going to say that i'm inclined to agree with the council person on this i actually don't see a case for leniency and um, I understand, Mr. Taylor, you're pretty consistent on your viewpoint on this, and I appreciate that. But my impression is that owner-occupied permits mean that the owner is actually there while it, the rental is happening. And based off the testimony of the appellant, they leave their house to rent it out, which is sort of not owner-occupied, but they're using an owner-occupied permit. I don't think that that's an issue that I'm supposed to deal with, but based off of that testimony, I don't think that's great behavior. So I'm not inclined to lessen the penalty. I would just go with what the council person suggested. Okay, Mr. Newton. Yes, I mean, I, I think honestly, I think uh, there there is the case for leniency that she went to try to renew her permit, and it was during a time that the office was open, and you know that there should have been the staff there to handle her process her permit renewal at the time, and you know I think that that is. A, a case for leniency there. And I, I'd be curious from codes. I mean, I, 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 my understanding is that they do not, they're not, they don't have to be there at the home if it's owner occupied. That only, you know, they don't have to be there, say, like, I was like three days a month or something like that. I, can codes kind of answer what that, what that uh, rule is? Uh, Bonnie I'm McBroom, property standards inspector, Department of Codes. Uh, the ordinance. It does not specify that you have to be on the property during the time that the property is rented. Uh, that may have been the intent, but it was not specified. However, if someone does have to be within 25 miles of the property at all times while it's rented in case they have to address any types of issues. Okay, thank you. Ms. Davis. 
I'm sorry, I didn't put my hand down. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I, I still, I still would be supportive of something between, you know, March and, you know, the first of May. Uh, I could, I could probably live with, but much, much past that, it just feels punitive in a way that, again, to me, the offense is, you know, there's no ill intent. You just forgot to pay fifty bucks, or, or three hundred. I think it's three hundred dollars now. It used to be fifty dollars, and so. Um, I, I just can't see making somebody wait that long um, for that, but that's just my thought. Ms. Karpenick? I was going to try that motion. Okay. Um, and <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm with you and and lenient, um, especially because there has not been any bad behavior, and I think the applicant uh, made an effort to to go and, and get the permit. And, and life happens, and there was a pandemic, and, and I'll say I'm also a mother, so I understand. Um, that life happens. And we've been, um, this motion will be similar to ones that we've done in the past for others that have um, not displayed a bad behavior. So my motion would be that the zoning administrator did not err and allow the applicant to apply for the permit on Monday, March 8th. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. This is David. Uh, motion. Uh, has been made about Ms. Karpenick, seconded by Mr. Newton. Is there any further discussion on the motion? If not, then we will call the question and vote. Start with Ms. Karpenick. I'm in favor. Mr. Newton. In favor. Mr. Pepper. In favor. Mr. Lawless. I can't go March 8th. I'm gonna have to vote against it. Okay. Um, Ms. Davis. I vote against it as well. And then I'll vote in favor. So I believe that was four to two. Uh, that motion passes. And I think that's it for today. Point, got another question. Is this gonna be the last time we have to do short-term rentals, Mr. Chairman? Oh, uh, I think that may be a question from Mr. Michael. <laughs> <laughs> John Michael. <laughs> Is Mr. Michael so still? Michael says last Thursday in March will be the first short-term rental board meeting. Okay. Well, if it's the last Thursday in March, and I would assume we have no more, unless unless something shows up on the 16th, which or the next meeting rather, uh, which or the 18th, I guess, is our next meeting. Um, but yeah, we're 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 definitely coming toward the end. So. Well, to one and all, I wish you all good luck and stay safe. Yeah, I hope I see everybody in person next time if it's safe. Yes. Uh, and we we will keep we're gonna keep a close eye on it and, and really pull all of our members and do do the best we can to get the you know, maximum participation, make sure everybody feels comfortable and safe. And uh, the goal is certainly to meet in person as soon as we can, but I also find great value in having all of us present. And I wanna make sure that we, you know, we keep doing that as best we can too. So I know it's harder. We appreciate everybody doing that and uh, you know, doing it this way. And I know we're going to get together real soon, one way or the other. It won't be too long. Adios, everybody. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. Bye. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.